Good evening, everybody. Let's uh, call our Planning Commission meeting to order with the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, led by the infamous Jerry Rubin. <laughs> Thank you. Let's, let's have our roll call, please. Commissioner Fonda Bernardi? Here. Commissioner Kennedy? Here. Commissioner Lambert? Here. Commissioner McKinnon? Present. Commissioner Perry? Here. And Commissioner Fresco? Here. Uh, and our next item is the director's report. Good evening, Commission. I want to first start with a couple of venue changes for the upcoming Planning Commission meetings on the DCP. On um, thurs Thursday, May 11th, we had planned to be at the uh, library, and that's now been moved to the east wing of the Civic Auditorium. And that's um, primarily because, as you know, with the library, we have to be out of the meeting room by 9 o'clock, and we wanted to be sure we had more time to uh, spend on the topic. And then on Thursday, May 18th, that was going to be in the east wing, and now that's been moved to the council chambers. So otherwise, it's... Um, the meeting dates and locations are consistent with the chart that you were handed out. Um, I want to go over a few recent council actions related to planning commission issues. One is uh, the 2600 Wilshire Landmark Appeal. Uh, the council denied the appeal and upheld the Landmarks Commission designation of the building and parcel. Uh, the same night, the council reviewed the St. John's Development Agreement procedural amendment. That's something the commission saw a few meetings ago uh, the council approved that and now that allows the um, north campus to be included in the phase two master plan along with the south campus on april 18th uh, the council heard the appeal of the conditional use permit for avery restaurant uh, the planning commission approved that conditional use permit on february 1st and then on the 18th of april council denied an appeal of the planning commission approval and upheld the approval um, the only modification to the Planning Commission's action was the alcohol service hours. Um, the Commission had approved 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. seven days a week. The Council modified that to be 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. on Monday through Friday, and then maintained the 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. weekends and holidays. And then last night, the Council approved the uh, LINK, um, Final Streetscape and Transportation Concept for the Lincoln Neighborhood Corridor Plan. Um, a few other updates. So parklets, um, construction started this week on the Main Street parklets. Uh, the first one is in front of Ben McCool's. That will take three to four weeks to construct. The other two, which are in front of Ashland and Hill and the Holy Guacamole Restaurant, that will take another two or three weeks, but they should all be done by mid-June. And then I also uh, wanted to mention tonight the city has recently received two awards from the California chapter of the American Planning Association. Uh, one is the Award for Excellence for Urban Design for the Creative Crosswalks Pilot Program. Uh, these are the two painted intersections at 2nd and Arizona and uh, Ocean and Broadway. And then the other designation is, or other award is a designation of downtown Santa Monica as a great place in California. So this award comes at a um, ironic and interesting and opportune time as we start the DCP process. And I think uh, the award reminds us that we have a great downtown and that the process of adopting a new downtown community plan is really focused on maintaining and enhancing what is already great. And that concludes my report. No pressure there, guys. Question. Actually, I do have a question. Okay. Do you know what the timing is on the community benefits uh, aspect of the St. John's? Is that way down the road? or? Yeah, that will be discussed as we get into the um, okay. negotiations for the development but agreement. That's, like that's a long way down the road. Okay. We're, we're, we have an EIR to do, and, and 
<laughs> but it will be a while before we start that discussion. Okay, so our next uh, item is the consent calendar, but we do have uh, a couple of chits about that. So uh, does anyone want to make a motion to remove them from the consent calendar and listen to the chits? I'll move that we pull. Some, oh, yeah, there's a chit there already off, oh, so there you go. Oh, their chits are already removed. Okay, so 5A. Uh, resolution of intention uh, for the Planning Commission to declare its intention to consider recommending the City Council uh, amendments to the land use and circulation element to implement and ensure consistency with the goals, policies, development standards, and procedures set forth in the Downtown Community Plan. And it looks like Jing Yao will give our staff report. Good evening, Commissioners. Um, this is a, a staff report on the resolutions of intention. So this is something that you've seen before in zoning cleanups and what have you. So this is very much a procedural um, uh, a matter. Uh, what it does is it actually signifies um, the start of the process for the Commission to consider amendments. There is no final language or content being decided upon tonight. It's simply the Commission's uh, signaling the intent to discuss these. Um, the reason these are being brought forward to you is that in the course of the DCP and the approaches and strategies and concepts that are in the downtown plan, um, you know, has in its current April 2017 uh, draft has necessitated um, some changes, uh, amendments to the loose, uh, the Civic Center specific plan and the zoning ordinance in order to be consistent with the strategies that have been discussed in a downtown community plan. Um, ultimately, you know, we're offering these up um, in order to inform your discussion. Um, once the commission uh, completes its deliberations, um, you know, you will then have uh, resolutions that actually reflect um, the, the red lines uh, to these documents if necessary. So just to briefly go through um, the uh, amendments, uh, you know, that, that, that may, um, that, that may occur. Um, again, they're being proposed um, for the loose or for consistency with the DCP and uh, changes to the periphery, that means the edges, you know, Wilshire and Lincoln and the housing strategy. Um, and then also the Civic Center specific plan, um, there's something called the Colorado Avenue Special District in the Civic Center specific plan that overlaps with the DCP. So we wanna make sure that we have that area controlled um, just by one document. And then uh, within the zoning ordinance amendments, um, there are uh, uh, some amendments in there that are associated um, with the downtown community plan. Um, for example, parking requirements, um, chapter 9.28, um, you know, instead of putting that in the plan, we decided to put that in the table. So it's just easier to find. Um, and uh, you know, you can see some of the other amendments there that clarify the relationship with the DCP and the zoning ordinance. Um, so with that, we recommend that you adopt the resolutions of intention tonight. Again, what that does is just signals your ability to discuss potential amendments um, in the course of your deliberations. Can I talk? Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Yes, you may speak. Um, I just have a quick question. And, 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 oops. Um, it's possible that it's, it's somehow included in one of these um, paragraphs on page five, the last, mm -hmm. the last resolution, Exhibit A. There's no mention of the adaptive reuse changes that we put into the DCP. Is that included in one of these? The adaptive the researchers are, are actually within the plan and not within the zoning ordinance. So we don't have to put that into the zoning ordinance? You do not, no, because um, what the, 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 or, the amendment that's being proposed for Division uh, 2, which is number one on the list, clarify the relationship between the DCP and the zoning ordinance, it would incorporate the plan into the ordinance by reference. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Jennifer? I have a question. The, um, each resolution um, near the end says uh, that, it's, that our um, meetings commence April 26th through May 25th. If it goes beyond May 25th, um, we'll just, that, it'll reflect that change when it, we, it comes back, or do yes. we need to make that change now? Yes, that, that's... that's um, so it's not necessary to make any change to that date now? You mean in the title of the resolution it says no, that? Um, like, for example, go to page two of resolution 17005, the one regarding the zoning ordinance. Um, the second paragraph. And each one has the same. 
Yeah, we can certainly alter that. that I think that was a typo. Okay. Um, should be to the May the 31st. But, um, you know, this so is, you, again, just the ROI. Um, right this is on. not the adopting resolution to amend anything. So. Fine. So whether it says the 31st or whatever, at the, when the yeah. time comes, we'll it, see It doesn't prevent you from continuing to discuss. Right. It's not a substantive provision. Got it. Thank you. Commissioner Perry. Yeah, the, the staff presentations covering uh, 5A, B, and C. Are, are we hearing all those at once? Vice Chair. Uh, yes. Thank you. I was making sure I didn't have a question. Jesus. All right. All right, so uh, I guess that brings us to Elizabeth Vandenberg. Thank you, staff. Uh, I see you have two chits for two items, which I believe you get to do consecutively. Great, thanks. Good afternoon, Planning Commission. It's been a while. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak to the uh, loose amendment. Um, I know how important the loose is. I've been involved for a while. So when I saw uh, what changes were being proposed, well, I think I understand now they're not permanent. I still do want to bring them up at the beginning of this process because I've seen some things go along with the way and then I don't get a comment. Um, I do see in the loose amendment, number one, that we are really moving away with the DCP from what the loose says, that we're increasing the FAR by 0.5 and um, by 10 feet for what the Lincoln corridor is. And I really challenge that, and I have heard over and over again how much time was spent on the loose. So I encourage you all to consider seriously maintaining those loose standards. Um, I also want to note that um, on the Lincoln analysis, and that's for uh, Tier 2, 100% housing, for the uh, Tier 2 um, one, that's the Amendment 2, um, once again, we see an increase in the um, uh, height that's more than the loose on the DCP so I challenge that as well in the Wilshire analysis I am a member of Wilmont and um, I see that we basically have uh, added some feet to the uh, Wilshire transition um, which was MUB with the loose so I challenge that as well and would uh, recommend also that we be included as you have in the DCP with the east side of Lincoln which is mid cities at a 40 uh, foot height for the tier two without housing. We see the transition um, from uh, Wilshire to Wilmot to be the same as mid cities and do not uh, understand why that wasn't put together in terms of the, uh, the uh, information that came out on the DCP. I would like to note in the staff report that we do indicate, it's indicated how much the, um, this action will reduce it, but my analysis shows that we've actually increased it. So there is one small place where it goes to 40 feet from the loose, but the rest of them are increases. So I um, challenge us to provide you know, broad information as we provide this out on staff reports. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lambert. Thank you. I have a question of staff. Um, and because I'm new, I get to ask this. Um, my, my, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, my impression is that the DCP actually down zones from what we have right now, Lincoln and Wilshire, Lincoln particularly, that the MUV standards for Lincoln right now in the ISO are actually higher in terms of more density um, than what we're proposing in the DCP. Is that correct? Um, within the north of Wilshire, so the DCP as it exists right now, um, it from within the Wilshire transition, it's uh, 50 feet. Right. Um, and 2.25 FAR. It's going off the top of my head, but um, it is what the, what the uh, table same as as what it is now. Um, on the uh, east side of Wilshire, the height is you mean Lincoln. also. Or, or, so, yeah, sorry, east side of Lincoln. It's also the same. There is a 0.5 FAR bump there for housing only. Um, on the west side of Lincoln, um, there is compared to the uh, tier two um, in the loose, it's a 10 foot height increase, so 50 to 60 feet, and a 0.5 FAR bump. However, that is not any more than what tier three would have allowed in the loose. Okay. Just theoretically, does a, does a 0.5 FAR bump really make any difference if there's a height limit? Um, certainly it, 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 it may. It's the, so the, the, the FARs that are proposed in a DCP um, are related to the height. We did a lot of study with um, our architecture consultant and, you know, in terms of taking a look at what a realistic and reasonable FAR would be compared to the height and the sort of typical lot sizes that we see so 
um, we believe that you know that it, these they they really do correspond to each other. And didn't there used to be a fifty percent FAR boost for housing? There used to be, yeah. yeah. But that's not there anymore. No, that's no. It's okay, uh, an attempt to be transparent. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions on that one? So we will move on to. No, she has another one. Well. Oh well, I'd like to say more, but I don't think that's allowed. So, I think the tier three just got bumped into tier two. So now you let me say it. So thanks. I'm ready for my next one. If okay, we we're moving C. on to 5C. Oh, 5C. It's very fluid. Okay. Um, thanks again for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I, I reviewed the zoning changes. So I was part of the zoning ordinance update discussions. And um, I really have some issues about 4 and 6. Um, they're both about parking. And I think parking is just critical to the DCP. Um, I'm in Wilmont, as I noted, and I'll just go on for a minute about what it is for that particular neighborhood. Um, with the Miramar Hotel, um, you're going to, uh, right at this point, everything in DCP is going to be parking overlay one. So that's a reduction in parking from citywide. Um, I do acknowledge that that was uh, increased from the previous DSP and DCP, so I appreciate that. But the Miramar neighborhood, the Ocean to Fourth, has the following situation. We have parking for people who cross to the beach. We have people from the promenade parking. We have hotel guests as well as their visitors. We have non-hotel guests who come to visit for whatever reason, and they park there. Um, they park in the neighborhood. We know that spa users park in the neighborhood, and we know other people will be parking in the neighborhood if the shopping goes in, the retail goes into Miramar. So we um, want to also note that we never really hear a discussion about employees, and I'm hoping that employee parking will be essential and a critical part of this discussion. We look forward to that. They're not mentioned. I guess they're always assumed that they just come in by drone. Um, we we want to make sure that as we go through the parking discussions, we're realistic and we're um, looking at a real future of 800 additional spaces. I think the in-loop parking um, money that comes in, I think we're kidding ourselves that we're going to get a big parking lot with that. I just don't see that being possible or the land being available. And I think the idea of trying to increment this is appropriate. And the other thing I do not understand is if people uh, generate more parking than what's outlined, um, the language is such that it really comes under the control of the city in the amendment too. So I just question that as being the right approach. Um, overall, parking will be a critical. The neighborhoods will be very interested in it, as I'm sure you all will be. And I'm looking forward to that discussion and that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, are there any? Uh... Chair, I'd move resolution 17003. Am I allowed to move all three at once? You need to take an individual vote, though, on each one. I move uh, all three resolutions 003, 004, and 005. Seconded by Commissioner Perry. Okay. Any discussion or are you ready to vote? All right. Let's vote on 5A, please. You can actually do a voice vote, but just um, clarify which one you're voting upon. Okay. Voice vote on 5A. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? 5B? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? I see. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? <laughs> Beautiful. So they were all carried, weren't they? They were all carried unanimously. Okay. Moving on to item 6A, the downtown community plan. Uh, this is the first of the hearings, and I believe staff has some things to say to us, and it looks like uh, City Manager Rick Cole will precede staff. I think I qualify as a member of staff, I Madam guess Chairman. You do. Um, I'm here actually because this is an interdepartmental and council priority, as it was a year ago when I came as part of the presentation of draft two. This, there is no more important um, duty of a city than to plan for its future, and no more uh, important document than uh, in Santa in Santa Monica than the plan for the historic heart of the city, the, the neighborhood that everyone shares, a neighborhood that belongs to all Santa Monicans, and that we've had so much discussion and debate going back over several years. 
I'm delighted that we can do planning. Uh, much of um, the debate in uh, the past uh, several years in Santa Monica has focused on individual projects, their merits and demerits. Um, they have uh, stirred up tremendous amounts of controversy over, over uh, height and design uh, and uh, character and uh, use. The whole goal of implementing the loose uh, and adopting the zoning code and now putting in place uh, the most important uh, missing piece of a planning framework for the entire city is the downtown community plan. And so we get to do real planning. Uh, and so your more than a month of hearings um, to take a substantive look at each and every element of this more than 300 page document is what we're all here to do. And I hope that the hard work that has gone into the draft, the hard work uh, that, will, uh, that will be reflected in community input over the next month, and especially the hard work that you as commissioners will put in to your recommendations to the City Council, will result in a plan that will put behind us uh, some of the more contentious battles over individual projects, that we will, as a community, not get something that's perfect, not get something that everyone agrees with each and every element of, but that we'll get a planning framework that we can live with, a planning framework um, that, ha that is transparent, that is consistent, and uh, we will neither uh, surprise uh, property owners and developers with uh, onerous rules or, or uh, sudden last minute changes, nor surprise neighbors with um, unexpected intrusions onto their quality of life and onto their, the, the neighborhood integrity. That, we can have um, predictability about how Santa Monica will um, gracefully and hopefully elegantly uh, develop while maintaining its overall character. Uh, that was really um, the most important message I think we've heard from the community. And um, that, that is that Santa Monica's downtown works. It's a great downtown. It doesn't mean we want it to stay exactly the way it is today or to try to turn the clock back and have it be exactly the way it was in 1950, um, but rather that we want to maintain the sense of identity, the sense of specialness, the sense of place, the sense, the sense that um, both neighbors and residents of the community take pride in and which is really the essence of why people come here. They don't come here for a generic bland, overbuilt, out of control, um, urban environment. They come here for a very special community that has a mix of uses, uh, a mix that is open and inclusive to all walks of life. Uh, any day or any evening, you can walk in Palisades Park, you can walk on the Third Street Promenade, you can walk um, in some of our growing residential neighborhoods in the downtown. You can walk on our pier. You can walk on the Colorado Esplanade. And you can see people of every color, of every background, from all over California, from all over the neighborhoods of Santa Monica, and frankly, from all over the world. That is very special and worthy of preserving and worthy of real planning to make sure that as we continue to grow and change and as our world grows and change, that we adapt and evolve gracefully. You'll hear from, from uh, our staff about the outreach um, that we've undertaken since this uh, came to you uh, last at the end of the, the, comment the comments uh, at the end of, of 2016 uh, on draft two. And your recommendations and your input are very much part of the stamp of the final draft that you'll be presented tonight. But there was much more uh, than uh, what uh, took place at the Planning Commission formal hearings. There were literally dozens of meetings, uh, well over a thousand people who weighed in online, lots of face-to-face -face discussions, lots of very thoughtful individual letters and emails that may not have reflected uh, a large organization or hundreds of people, but reflected real thought and real care. And the staff has analyzed and thought about all of them. 
And the result is this um, more than 300 page uh, downtown community plan final draft. I just want to say this um, before we turn to the substance of that. And that is what we're doing here is fragile. We live in a time when I think all Americans feel in the pit of their stomach uh, a worry about whether um, this more than 200 year experiment with democracy is, is not once again, uh, as, as in no more than, than a handful of times in our history, uh, suddenly under threat. And I don't mean from a particular administration in Washington. I mean from a sense that uh, of division and polarization in our society, a sense that um, that instead of working for the common good, that we've divided into us and them, and and uh, them is always the bad guys, and us is always the good guys. Democracy is too fragile um, for that kind of polarization. The, the, in the 1960s when I was growing up, and in the 1860s when the Civil War divided our country, and in the 1930s when the Depression divided our country, those were times when the American um, democratic experiment um, missed the iceberg, um, but the iceberg was there. Uh, and, uh, and a couple times uh, there were some scrapes uh, in the ship of state. Uh, here at the local level, we really do exemplify town hall, hometown democracy. Now, that is tough, that is challenging. People care passionately about planning issues, and that's a good thing. A community that doesn't care deeply about these things is in trouble. Santa Monicans have cared for decades deeply about their community. But there is a fine line between passionate caring about a community and demonizing people who disagree with you. And so I hope that over the next month, as we have over the last year, we'll have the opportunity to have a vigorous exchange of views about the best way to preserve and enhance this amazing downtown, but that it will not be a personal uh, debate, that it will not turn on good guys versus bad guys, uh, us versus them, but it will really turn on what is best, what is the, the best way to achieve what I think most Santa Monicans want, which is to preserve the sense of identity and the sense of history that makes this downtown unique while continuing to provide opportunities for economic um, advancement, uh, to opportunities for people to, how, to be housed from all, all incomes, uh, and for us to continue to be a welcoming and inclusive place. So um, I just want to emphasize how important I think the spirit of what we do. If we do this well, we will not only have a plan that we can stick to, a plan that's transparent and consistent and will guide um, the future well in, in town. We'll also be a model uh, for the fact that democracy is alive and well at the grassroots here in Santa Monica. Thank you very much. Thank you. More staff? Peter James. Thank you, Mr. Cole. He did it to me again. It's hard to, hard to follow that, but um, I'm going to give it a shot. So first of all, let me say thank you very much for devoting the better part of a month and a half to dive into this document that we've all worked so hard to produce. Um, before I jump into the presentation, I just want to spend a second acknowledging along the lines of what Rick just said, um, all the hard work that we put into it, the, the staff on the planning side, starting with Carrie Fukui, Shira Moak, Beth Rollinson, Francie Stefan, Rick Cole, our city manager, Stephanie Reich, Steve Mizukami, Rachel Kwok, and Roxanne Tanamori, just a handful of staff that have spent hours and hours in meetings, at workshops, at events, uh, not only to work on the plan, but to voice its messages. And then similarly, all the folks in the audience. I know many of you, Mary Marlowe, Mike Salazar, John London, um, so many folks that have volunteered their time to advocate for their perspectives. And we hope they can see themselves here in the plan. And of course, the Planning Commission are volunteers that dive into the material, get through it, and then form thoughts and opinions and ask the hard questions. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. And 
here we go. Uh, so tonight we'll be um, walking you through the, the general concepts that are embedded in the 2017 draft. We're going to follow the format that we established at the April 12th event. I'm going to spend some time talking about the general theme, some of the protections. Uh, Jing will come in and talk a little bit about the process and transparency. Francie will talk about the mobility issues. And then we'll end with um, um, a description of what lays before us in the next couple of meetings. I wanted to start by talking about what is the downtown community plan for those uh, in the audience and at home. It really is, uh, it's a vision of the people. It's, it's, a, it's a long document, as Rick mentioned. It's about 300 pages long. Um, and that seems like a lot, but, it, but people had a lot to say. And so the plan boils this down into a, uh, as concise a framework as it possibly can to guide us, not just the city, but private development, uh, special interest groups, those that provide services, for the betterment of our community. It tells us how to do it, when to do it, what our priorities are, and what our priorities are not. Uh, it is an action-oriented plan. It's a work plan for a lot of city departments. Uh, it identifies projects. It identifies improvements. Uh, it identifies gaps in our structure, things that we need to fill, and it tells us when and how to fill them. And lastly, it is, uh, it's a code document. It provides a set of rules and regulations that we, including the city, must all follow. Now, for the recent draft, we've produced three copies. I want to make everyone aware of the different formats. Uh, there's a very plain and simple version. It's the Word document. It's about 145 pages long. Um, this is great airplane reading if anyone has a two- or three-hour flight. For the five-hour flights, coast to coast, we produced a red line version. Uh, this is a very clear way of seeing where the changes were made, what the new words are, what the old words that have left the document. This clocks in at about 235 pages. And then the illustrated document is the final public hearing draft of the DCP. This is about 300 pages, although the last 30, 40 pages are actions that are repeated throughout the document. Um, and this is um, embellished with diagrams and illustrations, things that make it easy for the reader, we hope, uh, to penetrate some of the concepts in the plan. Now, we have paper copies available down at the counter. Uh, tonight, we also brought 52 flash drives that anyone is welcome to take home. And we will have more, uh, should the public demand that. So three different ways in paper of looking at it. It's available for download on our website at www.downtownsmplan.org. Now, uh, to begin, uh, we just wanted to orient folks to what we're talking about here. What is the downtown? Uh, its boundaries are invisible to the average walker, pedestrian, even, even a driver. Uh, but essentially, it's 230 acres uh, right at the shore of the Pacific Ocean uh, between um, the I-10 Freeway and Wilshire Boulevard. Some familiar landmarks to help us orient ourselves are the Third Street Promenade, that's the heart of our historic core. Uh, Santa Monica Place, the mall that anchors the end of the southern end of the promenade. The new Expo Station, a uh, relatively new landmark uh, on the landscape of downtown Santa Monica. As well as others that we all know, the Clock Tower, the Georgian Hotel, 100 Wilshire, uh, the tallest building in downtown at about 300 feet. Also, Whole Foods, a popular grocery destination for downtown residents and those that live nearby. The Boys and Girls Club, the main library, one of our most highly used public spaces in the downtown. The drugstore, CVS, Bay City's Deli. Um, and those are just a few of the many, many places that locals, visitors, and employees use on a daily basis. Downtown has really changed in the past 20, 25 years. And I want to talk a little bit more about that change in a few slides. But just a simple breakdown of how it's evolved uh, over the past two decades. We've really seen a, a doubling, more or less, of the residential population. And along with that, there's been new services that cater to those, those families, uh, those individuals, um, that has transformed the shape and character of downtown away from just a central business district to a mixed-use neighborhood. And that really is one of the focuses of the plan, is nurturing this neighborhood, providing it with the services and amenities it needs. Now, there's been a lot of talk about 
what the future will look like. What does the DCP portend? And uh, we contend that this is a housing plan, that by and large, the most significant activity that we will see in the development spectrum are housing projects. We anticipate an additional doubling of the residential population, another 3,200 folks. So that will take the shape of about 2,500 new units paced out over 15, 20 years. That's 125 units a year. The transit adjacent district where the metro resides is the area where we will see the bulk of that residential activity. Adding to that, we'll see a couple hundred thousand square feet of retail as downtown moves away, not away, but expands from 4th Street to 5th, 6th, and 7th. We started to see that with the rise of the restaurants like Cassia and Esther's moving towards Lincoln Boulevard. We've seen new hotels spring up and we may see one or two or possibly three more over the next 15 years. Creative office, the rise of WeWork, co-working spaces. A lot of these are adaptive reuse projects, but they are slowly adding to our stock, even though we're not building new office. And of course, there will be some traditional office, potentially, over the next 15, 20 years. Now, there's a movement within these land use categories. We may see all of this shift towards housing. And if housing starts to trend downward, we may see it shift towards something else. We don't really know. But the purpose of showing this map is that we think these are the areas where we're likely to see the change that happens over the next 20 years. And with that, we'll also see the addition of new public spaces that crop up within our downtown, providing that open space amenity for the residents and the visitors. We'll see streetscapes be redone so that our prime pedestrian corridors are made more comfortable, our prime destinations are made more accessible. We'll see more social services begin to populate the downtown as seniors uh, continue to mature in place, as families begin to grow. Uh, these things will begin to take root in the downtown, things that are already there. Because of the downtown's policies to encourage uh, additional nighttime activities, live theater, performance spaces, uh, we'll see uh, more art and culture begin to infuse our streets. We may see major public uh, pieces of artwork appear. We may have additional festivals, things of that nature. And we'll all be interconnected with a robust transportation system that puts walking and biking and driving and the use of transit all on the same level playing field. Now for people that fear that this is too much change, I want to look back to the previous 20 years. This was part of the analysis we did for the Sea Downtown 2030 website where we looked at the investment that had occurred in the downtown over the past 20, 25 years. It happens to be almost exactly the same amount of change. About 21% of our downtown changed in the past 21 years. And again, this was a compendium of housing projects, supportive retail, some office, some hotel and entertainment, not too different than what is proposed for the future. To get to the point we're at tonight, uh, which has been a six-year odyssey, uh, we've conducted a tremendous amount of research, but, but never have we gone as far as we did over the past year, which everyone in this room and at home was a part. We set up websites, we provided uh, analytical tools to show our math, to show the thinking behind some of our assumptions. <coughs> We quizzed people, uh, both in person and behind the comfort of their screens, to find out what their favorite places were, what were their priorities for downtown, their preferences for open space, their preferences for housing. All of this funneled into the 2017 draft of the DCP. We engaged them at workshops in large formats, in small groups. We asked hard questions, hard questions of them and hard questions of ourselves in order to identify the personality of downtown, the, 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 the kernel that we could um, infuse in the plan that would bind us uh, in, a, uh, in a positive future. And we think that we found most of it. Uh, there's certainly some issues that we will talk about over the next couple of weeks um, that bear some resolution. But by and large, I think what we're talking about here is about 80 to 85 percent agreement on many, many um, components of the plan. 
we brought a ground game. So workshop, online, public hearings, also walking tours to educate and inform, to ask people to look up, to engage in the city's history and to look towards its future. And we met with many, many people trying to find that balance uh, between perspectives, uh, slow growthers, pro growthers, special interests, dog park people, uh, recreation people, so many different perspectives, so many people vying for the spotlight. And the plan represents our best attempt to balance these multiple perspectives into a guiding framework for the next 20 years. So where do we stand? Do we disagree on everything? I don't think we do. At the end of the day, what we're talking about is a lower scale downtown. We're talking about a predominantly four to five story downtown with some areas punctuated by seven story buildings near the transit. We're talking about housing that is sustainable, not just from a building efficiency standpoint, but from an access standpoint, from an equity standpoint, from an affordability standpoint. And there's a lot of incentives and tools built into the plan, new structures, new requirements that will help us get there. We wanna preserve the economic vibrancy that marks our downtown and provide people with access to jobs across the spectrum from entry level all the way up to the top and recognize that our streets are in fact our public spaces um, and that we'll get other public spaces and we'll enrich them with experiences, with landscaping, um, catering from groups of 20 to 2,000 uh, throughout the downtown. We want to make sure that our uh, residents and our visitors come not just for the shopping, the restaurants, but for art and culture, things to enrich their lives and to enrich their experiences. And most importantly, we want to recognize that human history is not just written in books, but recorded in buildings. And so we want to preserve the very best of what we have. And we have a lot of it in the downtown, a lot of very uh, rich textures throughout the ages that show the, um, our march through time as Santa Monicans. And lastly, that the things that bind us together, the, 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 the network that connects us, our streets, our bike lanes, uh, our travel lanes, the new expo, our transportation network is so critical to get right. And I don't think, I know there's work to be done here, but I think we all agree that we have made giant leaps in this department over the past couple of years. So the area that we could not find consensus, and believe me, we tried, is around the subject of tall buildings, buildings that exceed the 30-year traditional height limit of 84 feet on three sites throughout the downtown. These little Pac-Man charts here show um, the results of a of an outreach effort that was both online, in workshops, and in focus groups. Fairly evenly split those in favor and those against. And so the plan provides options to, for the council to consider ways to process or not process these projects. We provided a lot of information about how certain groups um, stand on this subject and we will have to uh, work through it with the Planning Commission. I believe this will come up on May the 11th and possibly on the 17th and to be decided upon by the City Council. So a couple themes that run throughout the plan. I mentioned this early on, but at its core, the downtown community plan is in fact a housing plan. There's loads of discussion in the plan, a lot of careful attention paid to the regulations to achieve a balanced mix of units that are available to people of all incomes and all living situations. We've increased the amount of affordable housing that would be required for new projects and we've placed a mandate to mix up the affordable levels, which is something that's quite new. I mentioned we're into preserving our existing buildings uh, that support our identity as Santa Monicans, as a coastal community with rich architecture. So we have incentives that are both technical and economic in the plan. 
that will help property owners consider uh, adaptively reusing these structures and infusing them with new life rather than tearing them down. There's more transparency built into the review process within the downtown plan than in the past. In the past, there was that housing bonus discount that Commissioner Lambert brought up. That's been removed. We've lowered the threshold for review so that the, by and large, the majority of projects that come before the community will also come before the Planning Commission and give people a chance to provide feedback and help shape the project. Um, and for those projects that pass certain thresholds, the larger projects, we've designed a process that is not only transparent but rigorous that provides the community, hopefully, um, with a level of confidence that these projects are contributing rather than detracting from the spirit of Santa Monica. We want to ensure that both small and medium and large size businesses can exist and that you can grow or climb that ladder as your business grows. So we have created um, regulations that encourage small businesses. We've removed some of the barriers such as parking and, and other uh, typical standards uh, that, will, that typically block mom and pops from being a part of Santa Monica's economic diversity. Public space, this came up as the number one priority for downtown. This map's a little bit washed out, but effectively what it shows is there's an opportunity for five or six new publicly accessible spaces in the downtown. Now, by and large, these will be on private property. And I know we'll receive some comments about the validity of this um, concept. But at the scale that we're talking here, these, all of these projects have the potential to become significant new additions to downtown's public space network. Adding to that, uh, we have a very uh, generous uh, incentive for some of the older uh, publicly accessible private spaces like this one at 401 Wilshire to transform from a sea of pavement into something that is more active and engaging uh, to those passerbys. Small little changes that make big differences. And it doesn't have to be a cafe. It could be a farmer's market or a book fair or an outdoor concert. Things that activate spaces in the downtown and bring people together. With respect to the model of mobility, we've laid a lot of groundwork in walking and biking and transit. We continually work with vehicles and technology to bring all modes of transit under the same transportation sphere. And Francie will talk more about this in just a second. So let me walk you through some of the broad concepts about the changes that are included um, in the downtown plan. Now we start here. This is, uh, for, the, for the planning wonks in the audience, this is our land use district map. We have six land use districts in the downtown community plan that are carved out of existing character areas. Each has its own specific height and FAR standard. I'm gonna put that aside for a second and just talk more generally about urban form and urban design uh, with the hope that that is uh, more digestible to, uh, to the common viewer. So we start with the, the historic core. There's several changes that we wanna to make to the historic core and I'll walk you through those. There's also the properties that are on the periphery, the Wilshire Transition District that Ms. Vandenberg talked about, the uh, Lincoln Boulevard that Jing talked about, and our other peripheral area is Ocean Avenue at the shore of the Pacific Ocean. On the inside of the downtown is an area that we call the Neighborhood Village. This is an area where we anticipate some concentration of four and five story housing. It's a quieter part of town and then the transit adjacent where we allow up to seven stories. So I'll start with the historic core. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about the changes that were made from the 2016 draft to the 2017 draft. And there's a few in the core. The first and most important is that we want to expand the conservation district, the Bayside Conservation District, which right now stops uh, short of the, on the east side of Second Street. We'd like to extend that across to the west side of Second Street the Planning Commission endorsed this idea back in November uh, when we told you what our anticipated changes might be. You told us 
to think about ways that we could create special standards for this district in advance of a neighborhood conservation overlay district. So we've done that in the new draft. We've created special street wall conditions. We've removed certain requirements like open space from the historic fa fabric of these areas. And we've reduced the height from 84 feet down to 60 feet. And we've, we've carried that change to city projects as well. So that's a really big change. We had previously had an exemption for parking garages to go up to 84 feet. That's now been brought down to be consistent to 60. Uh, the last thing that we suggest in this area, and this is a future action, is to draw a boundary over the Bayside Conservation District and do some work on the texture and the landscaping in here to create a neighborhood conservation overlay district. And we do this because it, the streetscape and the pedestrian experience is so vital in this area. And it is uh, a matter of uh, building preservation, but it's also a matter of experience. And that experience is largely palpable at the human scale. Um, so uh, a future action of the plan will be to do a, a deeper study here to find out what type of guidelines we can develop for the conservation district. And this captures about 44% of all of the landmarks in downtown and 40% of all the resources. And here's an uh, aerial view of the downtown. The, the blue buildings are our landmarks and the red are our potential historic resources. So you can get a sense of, of how we contain that, that history within these boundaries. Now for the areas outside of the conservation overlay district, we have additional protections as well. We work really hard on this and it takes the form of sticks and carrots. And our two big sticks are these. Uh, the first is that we'd like to submit our downtown historic resource inventory to the state office of the state office of historic preservation and what this does is it it identifies these as eligible resources environmental resources under CEQA. Uh, what that means to the property owner is that there are additional regulations to comply with which essentially are disincentives uh, because they're timely they require additional analysis and if impacts are identified then they must be mitigated. So that's one really big stick. The second is a change to our demolition process. It's really flipping the script on the review process where the application will first go to the Landmarks Commission so they can do a robust review of the property to determine if it is more than just a potential historic resource. Maybe it's an actual historic resource. Uh, and we do that because a lot of times projects will move through the planning process uh, without that review up front. And so we're flipping the script on this and it also requires some other adjustments to the time frames that are uh, currently in place for the demo review. Um, as Ms. Lambert uh, questioned in the beginning when we were talking about the resolutions, we're extending new incentives to HRI properties, to landmarks, um, exemptions from parking, open space, uh, potentially uh, paying uh, half the fees for uh, entering into the, uh, the parking district. Uh, so there's a lot of new things that you'll see in there. You can see it in the red line particularly, but uh, we will have a night when we talk about historic preservation and we'll go into this in great detail, I am sure. For the periphery, uh, Ocean and Wilshire and Lincoln Boulevard. Uh, Ocean we've taken down to four stories. I think it's about 45 feet in its final form. We do not anticipate a tremendous amount of change to the background buildings on Ocean Avenue, but to be transparent, I should point out that two of the three established large sites are on Ocean, um, and there will be some great discussion about those sites in the future. Uh, Wilshire has been reduced to four stories as well. Um, we've restricted the commercial uses uh, for fear that they may infringe, uh, the parking may infringe upon uh, the residential neighborhood. Uh, so a comparison of the use tables from the 2016 version to the 2017 version will show that there are uh, serious limitations on where and how large commercial uses can be on that uh, northern side of Wilshire. Lincoln, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we're taking a special approach. We're leaving the western side at its 60-foot height limit, uh, but we are lowering the eastern side adjacent to mid-cities to... Um, 
to 50 feet. And we are providing uh, housing with the ability to attain the highest tier two heights in FAR and, um, and commercial will come in at uh, 0.5 FAR below that and 10 feet. Uh, so housing is really incentivized on Lincoln because we have seen a tremendous amount of um, interest in transforming that street and not just from the development community uh, but from the residential community to make Lincoln a better performing street um, by and large. And lastly in the, in the peripheral discussion we want to talk about something that is coming up after the plan. This is the Gateway Master Plan. The opportunity to resolve some of the long-standing circulation issues that plague forth the 4th Street off-ramp, that plague Ocean Avenue, by potentially capping portions of the freeway or bridging portions of the freeway, and to engage the community and the property owners adjacent to the I-10 in a discussion about what the future holds. So in the next 20 years, again, to get back to this map, we see some change. We see about as much change as we saw in the last 20 years. But we really see it taking on the character of a housing plan. Um, this is certainly a trend that we've seen uh, throughout the, path, the development of this plan, uh, ever since the adoption of the loose, And we have every reason to believe that it will continue uh, because, frankly, the demand for housing on the west side is insatiable. I'm going to pass the mic to Jing who is going to walk you through some changes to the process and transparency. Thank you, Peter. Um, so just walking through again some of the, a little more of the detail, and uh, we'll have opportunity to really get into this. Um, really on our first night of del deliberation, we're going to go through more of the housing strategy. Um, and then on the 17th uh, of May, when we'll actually have uh, Paul Silvern from HRNA here, um, and if you have questions about feasibility and what have you, um, yep. Oh, on the on on the tenth, um, we will be talking about generally the housing strategy. May seventeenth, we'll have HRNA um, here available um, as part of as we get into the requirements and more of the details. Um, so this is really an overview of um, the incentives that are in the plan uh, now. Uh, that are proposed for housing. Um, so you can see here in terms of standards, there's definitely a, a 0 0.5 FAR incentive, as Peter touched upon, um, for housing, and it's intended to, to favor uh, housing projects, uh, particularly on Lincoln Boulevard. Um, you know, there's a uh, incentive, also a height incentive um, for housing, and commercial is, is 10 foot lower. Um, there's also a process incentive. The intent here as part of the housing strategy was to create um, a known and predictable path uh, for, for housing projects. Um, so in that vein, uh, what's proposed in the plan is primarily a tier two development review permit process. And you can see um, in the graphic on the right, uh, what that means is that if you're a housing project and you're proposing tier two standards, um, you, know, you, you will go through a development review permit process. Tier three projects, and this is just a very qualified um, class of these is tier three projects up to 60,000 square feet. The reason we chose 60,000 square feet, that is a threshold that has been uh, part of the DCP proposal for quite some time. Um, that's quite representative of the very typical um, kinds of housing projects that we've seen um, downtown historically, these sort of uh, five story, you know, 60,000, many of them actually uh, less than that. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it sort of made sense to try to include them uh, within that class, although they are at a tier three height or FAR. Um, for development agreements for housing, that would be any Tier 3 project over 60,000 square feet um, for housing would require a development agreement. You can see in the dark blue boxes, um, the commercial thresholds are quite different, um, and that is on purpose, um, again, to uh, create that process incentive um, for housing for commercial property um, between uh, up to 30,000 square feet. That would be a development review permit, and then over that threshold is a development agreement. Uh, we are not changing the thresholds that are currently in the zoning ordinance for administrative approvals. So those are the sort of, um, you know, black and white doesn't meet the code um, uh, projects. Uh, for residential projects, that threshold is 30,000 square feet, so 29,999. Um, and commercial projects is uh, up to 15,000, so less than 15,000 um, will still have that administrative approval. So that is exactly the same as in the zoning ordinance and is not changing. Um, so with this strategy, what happens is that we are 
um, incentivizing um, you know, the housing projects that we think are uh, the vast majority of what we actually have in the pipeline right now um, and uh, you know, certainly uh, supports down to the DCP as a housing plan. Um, and it really reserves the development agreement, which was you know, one of the goals of this, that it really be reserved for these uh, atypical projects, uh, these, these larger unusual projects, and your typical housing project goes through a predictable process. What does that mean for housing? Um, what the plan includes is uh, increased affordable housing requirements um, so, you know, we'll get into way more detail on this on the 17th um, in terms of the feasibility analyses um, that were done. Included in your packet um, from tonight was some of the supplemental analyses uh, for offsite. Um, we will, uh, in November, uh, we actually had um, the bulk of the analysis done uh, for this, but we will uh, attach it um, to your packet for the 17th so you have that um, to, to refresh your memories. Uh, what that means is that within the DCP, um, the on-site requirements are uh, quite a bit higher than what we have recently been seeing in um, some housing proposals, so about 15 to 20 percent on-site. Um, we expect more in the 20 percent vein, um, and that is very depending on the height of the project. So a 50-foot project is required to have 15 percent, a 60-foot um, project has a 20 percent on-site requirement, and you can see that increases if it's off-site. Um, the other uh, unique aspect of the proposal is um, it's a it's a, a different framework um, than what you ha currently have in the AHPP, where it's sort of a staggered system um, of percentage requirements depending on the affordability level being proposed. Uh, what is proposed now in the DCP or required is that uh, of these housing projects, you know, there's a minimum percentage or so a uniform percentage. Um, affordable housing on site, and then that those number of affordable units then have to be um, divided into a variety of income levels ranging from extremely low to moderate. And that is based on the housing element, regional housing needs assessment proportions. So we have a very direct tie um, to the city's housing goals um, in that sense. Um, and then to touch on um, fees, uh, which is the other half um, of the project requirements, so we have the affordable housing and then for housing projects and commercial projects, there are fees. And these are substantially higher um, than what we have uh, for tier two projects in the zoning ordinance right now. So you can see here for housing projects, um, the fees would be increased to 90% um, of the maximum um, that are in existing nexus studies. Um, and for commercial projects, it would be a 23% increase above the base. And these are um, for the transportation impact fee, the parks and recreation fee, uh, the affordable housing uh, linkage fee. So um, all those th three fees, you know, we're seeing um, substantially uh, higher uh, percentages. And again, uh, this is because of the specific feasibility analysis that we did um, only for the downtown uh, area. Um, and then finally, um, just to touch on the uh, establish large sites and the transparent and rigorous uh, public process um, that is proposed um, in the plan and as presented as options for consideration. Um, what is presented here is that for these projects, um, you know, we, as you heard Peter say, there's uh, certainly a, a divergence, a variety of opinions um, about what the appropriate height, uh, you know, should be. Should it exceed 84 feet? Um, should it be allowed? Uh, what is proposed in the plan now is, uh, you know, that there be requirements for a development agreement, um, that the 130 feet um, be the uh, maximum height that is considered um, for these sites, um, and that they are required to submit, um, uh, you know, as part of their application, um, addressing uh, specific uh, requirements in the plan in terms of how do they contribute to downtown in terms of sustainability, open space, et cetera. Um, and then finally, uh, really options for, you know, if there's interest in this, how should they be approved? Um, you know, should it be a supermajority vote of the council? Uh, you know, is voter approval the right route? Um, so we've offered up sort of different options um, for, for discussion. Um, coupled with the large sites is this uh, concept of a, of a limitation on specific plan amendments. And this idea here is that once the DCP is adopted, that you know, it not be amended. Um, we, we've heard this concern, uh, you know, quite consistently um, throughout our outreaches. You know, what's the what's to stop someone from amending it? You know, the day after that it's adopted. And so the plan has this concept of you know, no height or FAR amendments to the plan uh, for seven years. And 
the way to sort of, you know, quote unquote, lock that in, again, there's different options that we presented as to how um, that, that might be accomplished, um, including, you know, potentially voter approval. Um, so, you know, again, this will be something that we will, we will be discussing more um, on the 17th. And we are certainly not um, exempting uh, the city-owned property at 4th and Arizona from these requirements. It's included within that. Um, I think at this point, I'm going to turn over to Francie for mobility. Thanks and good evening, and I'm glad you guys are getting up for a stretch. It is a good time to get up in a, for a stretch, it's too very appropriate at this moment. Um, so we have been together for a whole evening not long ago speaking about mobility. So this is a short, uh, a shorter presentation that's just going to touch on some of the highlights of the plan and some of the things that have changed um, and really sort of rest on some of the detail we talked about quite recently. So. Um, in the time that's passed since the uh, DCP process has started, we've had the good fortune to be able to welcome Expo, complete the Esplanade, complete the incline, bring in scrambles, uh, and we got the, the great pleasure of changing all those verbs to past tense in the current draft, and um, really think about what's coming forward and what are we thinking about in terms of the next steps in mobility. Um, and when we step back and think about it, um, it really is a, a an approach where everything old is new again. We have this fantastic hub of downtown, which is uh, it's a hub of bus service. It serves tens of thousands of people every day on Metro and Big Blue Bus. It serves tens, you know, thousands of people on Expo, um, and you really can get to many, many places throughout our county from that that hub. So um, what we really are thinking about is how do we make it an excellent experience, make it convenient, make it affordable, make the services customer focused, and really more than anything, make sure pedestrians continue to come first in downtown because it is the foundation of every good and functioning transportation system around the world. So while it's forward focused, it's also um, recognizing that essential value of what we currently have. Um, it also, the changes uh, in the plan look at how we can proactively look at traffic management, how we can do some more predictive traffic control for events. Um, we've talked together about new mobility quite a bit and we've sketched out some of the ways we can um, establish a vision but also be nimble as we move forward. Um, at the Planning Commission's request, we have included new things about resident access options and looking at some of those issues that, that the commissioners have brought up over time. Looking at right-sizing our parking, we did tweak the parking standards a little bit um, to uh, do some of the, some similar things that were done in the zoning ordinance and also make sure that we continue to support Vision Zero and our safety. So, walking, a few specifics, um, for sure, Downtown is a place people come to walk. They come to walk uh, as free entertainment. They come to walk as exercise, and they come to walk to do business. So we want to make sure they can do those things uh, throughout more hours of the day. So additional lighting is a key piece. New bridge improvements. That includes the gateway access master plan concept that you'd be able to bridge over the freeway, looking at that 7th Street bridge that we'd all like to bring back, and many other things like that. Um, and also looking at ways we can remove some of the obstacles in our sidewalks to get better effective width, but also to uh, ensure that we widen where we need to accommodate additional pedestrians. Oops. And when it comes to creating transportation choice, continue to build upon our great resource in downtown. Um, we know that Lyft and Uber and other um, car services are all over downtown, and uh, we are looking at ways in coordination with other cities um, of how we can incentivize additional sharing and, and additional electrification of that fleet so that it really meets our vision of being a sustainable community. Also looking at our transit facilities, we have a great transit mall uh, on Broadway and Santa Monica Boulevard, but most of our service is now going north-south, so we really need to look at where we can create some additional dedicated transit f facilities or adjust the ones we have and put them in different locations. Looking at protected bikeways so that more people can comfortably come to downtown on bicycle, even if they're not the most confident rider, that they will feel comfortable in a fairly uh, busy environment. And also expanding things like the free ride, otherwise known sometimes as the coconut shuttle, um, a, an electric car hailing or a vehicle hailing service that already exists and is doing well. 
and not to forget get assistance uh, from the GoSAMO TMO out to employers and visitors and residents. For traffic management, um, again, this is about using technology to move more people more efficiently in our roadways, um, it, reducing the amount of hunting people are doing, so reducing the amount of tr the distances they have to travel in downtown, as well as looking at our event management. With new technologies, we know that our phone is now our best way to figure out how to get around, especially in a new environment. So looking at ways we can tap into things um, that take advantage of those technologies. Also looking at ways that um, ride matching can increasingly be handled through technology. That includes things like registering on a site for microtransit, which is, um, in other words, uh, small, small buses that may commute people from downtown Santa Monica to Glendale or the San Fernando Valley um, for their daily commute. Also looking, as I mentioned, at ride sharing options that are um, more shared and not so, you're not alone with your Uber or Lyft driver, you're actually sharing the ride with someone else. And smart infrastructure. We know that when your phone goes dead now, you kind of may feel stranded, just like you felt when your gas tank went empty. So we want to make sure that people are able to charge up if they need to get home. Uh, I skipped the driverless. Um, and with regard to what we all read in the papers constantly about, you know, either that driverless cars are coming now or that driverless cars are not coming now and won't come until 2050, because um, both of those articles are in, every, are in the papers every day. Um, really looking not so much at how do we keep up or how do we be reactive or how do we not be reactive, but how do we actually really stick to what we want to be as a community and make sure that we are adopting meaningful technologies and not just the newest, brightest thing, but rather the thing that is going to progressively build us to into the community that we want to be. So looking at that vision and then creating a working group to be strategic in uh, integrating those into our current system. Right sizing parking. Um, as I mentioned, we, we took a page out of the zoning ordinance and we looked at ways that we can reduce the barriers um, to changes in land use through parking. We don't want to, to regulate land use through parking. It's not an effective or smart way to do that. And uh, we looked at ways that we could also increase the um, length of viability of our existing buildings downtown by ensuring that they can um, put in place uses that keep those buildings up. Um, so looking at calibrating that, looking at calibrating it with a, a look to the future, but also um, not too far in the future, so right-sizing it for now, knowing that we can change these standards over time. Expanding our in-lieu district to be the entirety of downtown and not just um, the small area that it currently is. And pricing it effectively so that when you need it, it's available for you. And last but not least, safety and health. It won't be a fun place to walk or bike downtown if you feel it threatened. So making sure that we're improving the sidewalk experiences through um, special sidewalks, but also making sure that those intersections feel like you're protected. And that's the speed of any vehicle going by you, whether it's a bus or a car, um, is going by you at a speed that feels comfortable and that enables you to have a good experience on two feet or on two wheels. So the plan has um, some very specific metrics in it. We're committed to monitoring the performance of downtown. We're committed to um, measuring how we're doing in terms of single occupancy vehicle trip reduction. So there is a target to, to uh, have a reduction down to 35% of employees driving alone. That's a pretty aggressive target, as well as 50% of all people using downtown arriving without coming alone in their car. Now they can carpool and vanpool and they still may be in a car but they won't be alone, um, thus reducing the demand for roadway space as well as parking. And Vision Zero, making sure that downtown feels safe as a place to be and that we're using our dense multimodal downtown as a place to reduce our emissions and get to a more sustainable community. So with that, I will pass it back to my colleagues. So now we're almost done. Um, just uh, touching the, the last chapter of the plan actually talks about implementation and monitoring, and um, you know we don't want to downplay that um, uh, because we do have a 3.2 million uh, square foot cap 
um, on all development. And it's divided, you know, it's primarily housing, um, as Peter had uh, gone through earlier in the presentation on, you know, what the future looks like. Um, and the full explanation is, is on our uh, build out website. Um, the last chapter also recognizes implementation is a shared responsibility. So for the hundreds of actions um, that are currently in the plan. Uh, in that last chapter, there is a table that has each and every action, um, and it assigns it to uh, you know, a, a lead, uh, whether it's a city agency and you know, who the partner agency will be, and a time frame um, as to uh, you know, when you, you can expect to see that implemented. Um, you know, we would like for the downtown uh, plan to be used as uh, you know not only something a tool for the community um, to understand um, you know how are we going to bring these things to fruition, but also be used in you know as council uh, makes budgeting decisions um, and uh, you know how how downtown will grow um, over over the horizon year uh, of the plan. Um, we anticipate that there will be uh, a monitoring report similar to the loose um, and what's uh, uh, in the plan right now is that that monitoring report uh, be concurrent so that the loose and the DCP, because we're collecting very much the same metrics and there's a very large list um, of performance measures that we'll be uh, collecting, um, you know, so that people can understand how the DCP um, is performing and how the loose is performing. Um, and that's about every five years. Um, and then the associated amendments, um, you know, as you uh, took action on the ROIs, uh, you know, so I won't spend too much time on this, but, um, you know, that there are uh, potentially uh, these amendments to some of these adopted, adopted documents um, in order to uh, fully implement and integrate uh, the DCP um, into, into, our, into our adopted city policies. Um, I wanted to now go through the environmental impact report. Um, you all received uh, the CD um, of the EIR. It's a pretty large um, volume, and I just want to at least provide a, a summary um, of what it is. Uh, it's, it, it's really intended as a reference for you to inform decision making. Jing, um, could I just process. point out that most of us don't have computers that run CDs anymore? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our bad. <laughs> it's also available to download online, and we'll have it on flash drive as well. Um, so it's a program EIR, um, and uh, what that means is that it does not uh, authorize particular development. It's you know really looking at um, analyzing the impacts um, of the DCP on on a program and, and policy level. Um, it was initially circulated for a 90-day public review period um, that was uh, well beyond the 45-day required uh, as required by CEQA. Um, in response to uh, some comments that we received on the initial uh, public draft regarding the project description, um, the EIR was then recirculated uh, for project description and land use, and that was recirculated for an additional 45-day comment period. So there was a total of 135 days of uh, public uh, comment period um, on the EIR. Uh, we received about uh, 45 um, letters. Uh, one letter actually has about 400 comments, so, um, you know, but it, that, that was okay. <laughs> and um, uh, what, what the EIR studies is actually uh, Scenario A and uh, Scenario B. Um, and Scenario A and Scenario B actually came, uh, Scenario A came from direction from council. Scenario B then was a reduced um, version of that. Um, the EIR uh, studies a horizon year of 2030, and that is the same as the downtown community plan. Um, and the, so the final draft that you have before you now, this April 2017 version, is actually substantially similar to, to Scenario B, and it actually has um, probably you know, some similarities to actually Alternative 2, uh, which is actually the reduced uh, project in the EIR. It's not precisely the same, but it's almost kind of a high root of a Scenario B um, Alternative 2. Um, you can see here the scenarios that were tested, um, A and B, and we will um, provide more detail. Um, you know, it's, it's within the EIR as to um, the uh, uh, land use forecasts um, that, that encompass both. Again, Scenario A was based on Council's original direction from August 2013 when they first established a project description for downtown. Um, and uh, you know, that, that then was the, uh, the basis for the environmental analysis. Um, scenario B was reduced from that, and Scenario B actually achieves um, no net, the, the loose uh, goal of uh, citywide no net new trips. Um, so that is uh, certainly something that we, that, that was a very key goal, um, you know, in, in looking at the DCP. And there were, in addition to that, five alternatives that were studied, including the no project. So what if the downtown community plan was not adopted and 1984 um, loose continued? Um, alternative two, which is a reduced project, essentially an elimination of tier three. Um, you know, that's why I, I kind of mentioned that really the only area where we have 
tier three. Um, and DCP is the transit adjacent uh, zone at this point. Um, and then alternative three and four um, were really variations on a one-way street mix that um, you know, we were asked to look at. And then alternative five was, you know, what if uh, we had uh, less uh, housing uh, as a land use mix? You know, what did that do uh, to, to the environmental impact? Um, at the conclusion uh, of the EIR, you know, what uh, stood out as the environmentally superior alternative was uh, scenario B. Um, you can see here that, um, that there were mitigation measures required uh, in a variety of areas. Ultimately, significant and unavoidable impacts were identified in terms of construction, air quality, and noise. Um, cultural resources, um, I will note for cultural resources, um, it, it really was uh, a conservative conservative conclusion um, because although we of course have many protections that are now proposed in the plan um, you know there is the potential that in the future someone may demolish buildings so you know we really had to conclude that there was a significant and unavoidable impact um, in that regard and in transportation and circulation um, there were unavoidable impacts at I believe was it 13 16 intersections um, and the analysis includes both level of service and uh, VMT, um, consistent with uh, what we're required to do now, pursuant to CEQA, and also looking forward um, with, with what we will be required to do under um, SB 743, which is um, you know, something that we've been providing you uh, continuous briefings upon. Um, as you heard me mention, um, the final EIR includes um, all the information, incorporates the draft EIR, um, all uh, revisions, uh, errata to that, and all responses uh, to comments received um, in you know, both the draft EIR and the recirculated EIR. Um, with that, we are towards the end here and talking about the timeline. Um, just looking forward as to where we go from here. So today um, was an overview of the plan, an introduction, an opportunity for uh, people to provide public comment. Um, we want to note that the public hearing will open today and remain open um, until the commission is anticipated to vote on May 31st. This sets out um, over uh, the course of the month, uh, the Planning Commission's uh, anticipated schedule of discussion so that the public has an expectation of what um, uh, you know what what the Commission will be deliberating upon of course it doesn't lock you into these um, it's certainly to help you um, organize your deliberations and certainly subject matters may flow um, over to the next meeting um, and you know as you always do you'll make an announcement at the end of that meeting and we will clearly have that um, uh, on, on the agendas uh, for, for the Planning Commission um, if you know, the Commission votes on the 31st, we anticipate that the Council uh, will then uh, begin their deliberations on the DCP uh, in July. Uh, with that, I think that ends our presentation and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. And I think we have a question from Ms. Lambert. Um, and this is sort of self-serving, but I'm not going to be here on the 10th and 11th. And I'm kind of curious about how this process works. Is there actually, there's not going to be decision making at each meeting? No, um, I, I, I think that that's something the commission can, can discuss today as to, um, you know, how you'd like to proceed with that. Um, I can offer to you that in the course of, for example, the zoning ordinance uh, deliberations, there were, I wouldn't call them straw polls, but sort of these sense of the commission um, discussions. Um, and that may be something that is, that is helpful to you to sort of uh, have an opportunity for the, discussion, for the commission to discuss those topics and, um, you know, bring some closure to them at, e at each meeting. I'm just concerned about particularly the housing discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be here on the 11th. Right. Um, so, but so you said on, the HRNA report is going to be on the seventeenth anyway. So there'll be something happening. Correct. At that point. Right. Right. Okay. Commissioner Kenny, um, can I just follow up on that? Um, what was the thought process about having HRNA here the following week? I mean, um, sometimes we, when the consultants come and give us some information, it's helpful to think about it afterwards or there's questions about it afterwards sometimes the consultants can't come back it's, it's a timing thing it's a financial thing right it, is it, it possible to sw switch it? it it had to do actually with with their availability um, as well the, the 10th is really more of a um, an, an overview uh, strategy discussion so it's more policy based as opposed to the specifics of the requirements and the feasibility which uh, we felt was a more appropriate meeting um, for, for them to attend on the 17th I just, you know, as I, I mean, housing is my background. I really would appreciate being here for the HRNA report, which is on the 17th. They can't come. 
Are there any other questions of staff, Mar uh, Commissioner Fund of Yeah, Earth? maybe you can uh, speak to this. You said that the horizon time for the downtown plan is 2030. Right. What is the starting point of that downtown plan? When you say there's going to be 25,000 new units, whatever it is, what's the starting point? It, it actually is from the baseline year. Um, of which the, is? Of the EIR, which was uh, 2016. Yeah, 2016. So from 2016 to 2030, Correct. 14 years, we would get these 2,800 units, 2,500 units, whatever. Anticipated, the, right. Anticipated, I see. Um, and does that align with the EIR frame? Yes, that, that, that is absolutely based so on So everybody frame. starts at 2016 and the race ends at 2030. Right, and it's, I think it's, it's worth worthy to mention that it's not that uh, it's just projects that were submitted in 2016. We also have to account for projects that maybe they were approved in 2012 or 2013. They actually have to be completed and you know, receive their certificate of, of occupancy to be counted um, against that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question about that. Um, 20 year plan, and we only have 14 years. Do you see what I'm saying? Uh, is this going to, do we have to start this again in five years? We've I'm, been at this a while, so it's. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, why, why, why wouldn't we kind of adjust? Would we have to do the EIR over? Um, it, 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 it really very much is tied to the environmental analysis. Um, mm -hmm. Our traffic uh, model really. You know, it has a horizon year of 2030. That's the loose horizon year. Um, the DCP really is a follow-up action. It's not a brand new thing that was just created. It's really that's a subset the of the of the loose. Right. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we we're consistent with that framework. Thank you. I have two clarifying questions. One is there there was some um, concern among people who commented about the Gateway Master Plan. That's it's going to be a separate environmental process, I assume. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. So it wouldn't appropriately be within the DCP EIR because we don't know what we're doing. Right. Right. Um, the other question that came up a number of times was the large sites. This is a program EIR. It's not a project specific EIR. So if any of those projects, their initial studies, what have you, show that they need additional environmental um, work, that will happen. And, yes. it, and it's very likely that will be the case, right? Yes. So there's no expectation that the large sites environmental, environmental work has been finished in this EIR. It really has basically not even begun. Right. right. Okay. Thank you. Mario, do you have something else? No. no. Okay. Sorry. Uh, awesome. Uh, let's move on to our public testimony. Or we'll start with uh, Richard Orton. And then if, while he is uh, moving forward, maybe we can have Daniel Shanice, Jerry Rubin, and Mike Salazar prepare in the wings. Did Rick Dick Orton leave? Okay, well then it's Daniel Shanice. Hello. Uh, I just had three quick things about this. First one's for context. I live in Wilmont on uh, 4th and Montana in an old dingbat, roughly 35 feet tall, 32,000 32, square feet. Uh, so when I see that a lot of the downtown area is being in essence, sort of down zoned and lowered in scale to what is an existing building from the early 70s in a purely residential area that doesn't make a lot of sense to me when we're living in a time of housing scarcity. To me, it would make sense to uh, just say 60 feet for downtown is a, is a good height for sort of by right building. Okay, go in, all housing or even mixed use go around for retail uh, and the uh, part of what Peter said and I'm sorry not to call you out but he said that uh, that that's not too different from what we've done in the past 20 years well if the past 20 years have gotten us a record amount of housing scarcity why are we then doubling down on the idea of not building much just because hey you know for giggles we'll just do that again so we can just have 20 more years of higher ends as opposed to building tons of housing. Uh, it, it's gotten to this situation where I would like to, when my son moves away to college, I'd like to go get a one bedroom apartment for my wife and I, because he won't be there. 
but we can't because one bedrooms have escalated in price so ridiculously that no, we'll just sit on a two bedroom that a family could have versus going and, and getting the one bedroom that we would actually like and use. So it's just the scarcity and not allowing more to be built is what bothers me with the plan. Uh, the third thing is, is all the mobility stuff is great. I have zero issues with that. Uh, I walked here tonight. We walk here every day uh, or walk to downtown very frequently. Uh, my son, on the promenade all the time with his friends. So uh, downtown works for me, mobility-wise, just from a pedestrian and cyclist standpoint. So thank you. Your son will be back. What's that? Your son will be back. Yeah, you need the room. <laughs> you definitely need the room. Trust me. We're, we're Jerry Rubin. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Jerry Rubin. All right. Thank you very, very much. I want to thank city staff uh, for this uh, long range plan. I uh, might not be around in 2030, but Santa Monica will continue to be a great city, I'm sure, as long as we plan for realistic growth. Positive DCP unveiling meeting took place a few weeks ago. Kudos to everyone that helped with that. We have a great process. Santa Monica is a great city and our downtown is already a great downtown. I do think we need predictability, as our city manager said, but some flexibility is still very important. We need to maintain our AAA bond rating in all of these discussions. The economics, jobs, services, and community benefits derived from smart development are very important. So is the real need for housing, including much more affordable and low-income housing. We should understand that a residence versus visitors approach is just not productive. We should understand that realistic and smart planning for growth and change is positive and forward thinking. No one wants Manhattan skyscrapers, but a few taller, well-designed buildings can be a positive addition for our great city. More open space, etc., etc. More jobs, union jobs with the hotels, very important. We need substantial community benefits and strong transportation management plans for larger developments. But we should not accept Doomsday scenarios for growth are that development is as automatically a negative thing. Anyhow, a few more quick things. We need more trees and green landscaping. We need more creative and interesting public art in our downtown. And we need more continued outreach, like OSAMO, to get people out of their cars. That's the real important challenges not whether a building is skinnier and taller. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Mike Salazar, uh, who is getting an extra minute from Michelle Perone. She's gone, so I'm, I'm going to try to... Uh, after Mike, let me just give sure. these names. Uh, sorry. Lauren Paul. Richard Brand and <coughs> Elaine Christopoulos. Okay, Mike. Good evening. Um, I sent uh, the commissioners a letter, uh, I think yesterday, with nine points on it, and I'll go through some of those tonight. Um, most importantly is that uh, it's really difficult to have what I would consider an adequate EIR review tonight. Uh, it's just one week after um, the issue of the 4,300-page report and, and appendices, which some of us try to read. 
Um, I know you all do. Um, it just seems to be a pattern that's gone on with this downtown community plan that the EIR continues to be um, glossed over or downplayed, and I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. I think when we look at the alternatives in there, we could have easily had, uh, instead of the housing only option that was rejected as infeasible, we could have easily had a housing rich option that I think is what this plan is now trying to do, um, but it could have clarified um, some true benefits in traffic and and possibly other benefits, but um, alternative two wasn't studied at the equivalent level um, that the scenarios were, nor some of the other alternatives, and that's, I think, unfortunate. Um, my main point tonight is what I call the elephant in the plan. Uh, which is um, somewhat site-specific, but also, I think, a general concern about parks in downtown. And what better to go with housing than parks? Um, our downtown plan has come a long way, and I like the direction that it's going now, but it still doesn't have a heart. There's just no soul to it. Um, we have an opportunity here to create that with one of the large sites. Um, and we have the opportunity with Arizona Street uh, to create an east-west promenade that's also missing, that connects neighborhoods to that potential park open space development site, to the promenade, to Palisades, to the sea. And we're missing that opportunity. Um, the fourth in Arizona project I think is somewhat overwrought, um, and depending on what side you're on, uh, and I mean physically, it's either a you know beautiful twilight uh, example of a cascading development with some levels of open space, or it's a 12-foot wall that uncharacteristically spans two parcel sites, which has never been done in our downtown before, probably for good reason. Those of us in Ocean Park you know, we'll see this wall, uh, the visitors arriving on the freeway and the expo will see this wall first. Um, it's no coincidence that this is never shown in a rendering. I think there's been one worm's eye view from 4th Street um, from a distance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lauren Paul. After her will be Richard Brand. And Good Elaine evening. Christoph. Good evening, Lauren Paul of Latham & Watkins on behalf of our client, Second Street Corporation, owner of the Huntley Hotel. To begin, we'd like to thank you for your and staff's hard work on the downtown community plan. We know there's a lot behind us and a lot before us, and we appreciate the time that everyone has taken to create this plan. We are still conducting our review of the recently released DCP and final EIR. As part of that process, we will submit a detailed comment letter for your review and consideration. While our review is ongoing, we did want to speak today in favor of one of the recent additions to the plan. As you know, staff has added the concept of requiring a supermajority of the council or voter approval for development at the Miramar. That would, in excuse me, that would increase the height above 84 feet. We appreciate staff's addition of this concept and we think it is a move in the right direction to address the controversy surrounding the Miramar site. While the proposal is a step in the right direction, the wording should be expanded in two ways. One, the approval should require both a supermajority of the council and a vote of the people. If the development that exceeds the existing zoning standards is to be approved for the Miramar site, it should be one that is overwhelmingly supported by the community. Secondly, the additional approval requirement should not apply only to an increase above 84 feet. The requirement should apply to any height or density increase over the existing standards, which would permit a height of 45 feet and 2.0 FAR. These existing standards are generally consistent with the proposed standards for the ocean transition zone of which the Miramar sits. While much of the focus on the Miramar has been about the height, I want to take a moment to focus on density. The existing density of the Miramar is 1.4 FAR. The DCP proposes a maximum density for the Miramar without a vote of the people of 3.0. This is over a doubling of density and would permit 575,000 square foot development, which would permit over 300 more square feet than is currently existing on the site. When the community discusses the concerns over the massive development potential of the Miramar, it's not just about the height. 
while that's the easy thing to focus on, it's about the density too. If the Miramar is going to be allowed to increase the density in this way, that should be reviewed as, by a vote of the people as well. Let me remind you that the Miramar's own proposal that was widely criticized for being too dense was 2.8 FAR, which is less than what the proposal of the city is. Accordingly, we urge you to revise the DCP to provide that any development the Miramar as a large site be approved by a supermajority of the council and a vote of the people. Providing for review by the people of height and density is the only way to ensure that any new development will be embraced by the community. Thank you for your time. As I mentioned, we'll be submitting a comment letter in the future. Thank you. Uh, we have a question for you. Oh, Ms. Paul, you are with an eminent law firm that represent the Huntley Hotel. Is it fair to suggest that all of your comments are special pleading on behalf of the Huntley Hotel? Yes. I obviously in the past have had very good relations with all the hotels in town. What, what is the FAR of the Huntley Hotel, for example? It is, it is much more than 3.0. But is it Would it be, say, 16? It's, I actually don't know at the top of my head, but it's I mean, very high. It is a tall building and it's got a lot of FAR. Is it not a little difficult for you to turn up here and suggest that the site across the road, which I, I didn't vote for when it came to us, has some problems when your own site is spectacular? So the, the Huntley's primary concern with the development at the, at the Miramar is about maintaining the scale and character of the community of which it exists. And so creating a doubling of the density on that parcel would massively change the character of the community. I see. Thank you very much. I, I, I want to make sure I understood you correctly. Did, did, were you, did you say that it, with the proposed FAR, the increase um, in density on the site, if there were a new project, would be 300 square feet? 300,000. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, I understand Richard Brand is not here, is that true? And uh, Elena Christopoulos is not here? Uh, so that brings us to Jason Islis, and then Leonora Yetter, and Carl Hansen after that. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Jason Islas. I am a Pico neighborhood resident and, um, have, you know, Samuel High grad, grew up here, um, and I've seen the sort of downtown change in the 31 years I've been around, I know. Uh, 32 soon, actually, in May. And I know how much uh, staff worked on this. I, I've been following it, and I, I perhaps as, as good as any person, know how hard something like this is to um, to do, especially given the politics in town. Um, that being said, uh, I was at the um, unveiling, and uh, I found that I think there were two crises in addition to our crisis and uh, democracy at the moment, uh, economic disparity and climate change. As a response to those two fundamental crises that we are facing as a nation and in the microcosm as a city and as a region, this plan is leaves a lot to be desired. Um, I heard consistently that we are reducing standards for, for growth while calling it a housing plan, and I believe the two are fundamentally incompatible. We can't, in one hand, say we are continuing the slow growth status quo of the last 20 years, and we're also pro-housing. I want to echo a previous commenter who said, fundamentally, we shouldn't be doubling down on the legacy of the last 30 years because it's gotten us to where we are now, which is we have families who can't afford to move here, we have increasingly the, the working and middle classes priced out of Santa Monica. As a first generation high school student, or sorry, college student, I credit the fact that I was able to go to Santa Monica schools with the reason I was able to go to college, because working class, my working class family was able to live in a mixed income community. That is increasingly scarce. And if we don't create a plan that allows for quality jobs, growth in quality union jobs, and growth in housing opportunities for people of all incomes, then we are 
basically kicking the can down the road to a future generation and say, we get it, there's a crisis now, you deal with it. That's what this plan fundamentally does. It says, we don't want to do the hard lift of creating and dealing the hard politics of addressing the root causes of these issues. Let the next generation of leaders deal with it. As someone who hopefully is a next generation of leaders in this town, I hope that you would take, take a second and consider what we're going to inherit, a more intractable housing market, a more intractable economic disparity issue. And um, we have the chance right now to say, look, we, we get it. Growth is controversial. But so should the fact that we are increasingly saying no to middle and working class families moving into our town. Increasingly we're saying no to union jobs that make sure that parents have enough money that their kids can go to quality schools and do better than they did. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question, Mr. Question. So, Jason, I don't think anyone is saying build nothing. It's about the scale and the pace of change. And you don't think this is an adequate document. What is, in your mind, something that would be adequate? What is it you're advocating for? We know what you're against. I think the 2,500 number unit should be a minimum a bare minimum, not a maximum for the next 20 years. So that still leaves me a little adrift. We may build at 25, but you've said this is a bad document. What is it you think would be better? I think we've consistently made a point, staff has consistently made a point about the fact that we are reducing um, the zoning standards uh, in particular areas. We're getting rid of that 50% um, bonus for housing. We are increasingly compromising um, uh, the incentives and we're incentivizing lower scale growth, even once around housing, and to a point where I worry that it might make even reaching that bare minimum of 2,500 infeasible in the next 20 years. Thank you. Uh, Leonora Yetter. Hello, my name is Leonora Yetter. I'm a resident in the Wilmont area. And I just wanted to speak about, you know, the housing concern. Um, I'm very concerned about the housing crisis here and the cost of rent and housing. And I know that most people here are as well because that was a conclusion in the DCP itself that housing is a major concern of most people here. So in light of that, it's really hard for me to understand some of the decisions that were made in this DCP, you know, to do down zoning and um, to have more growth restrictions and to commit to a low scale downtown, as it was called. Um, you know, I think the, the 2,500 units over 20 years, that's, um, that's a big concern because 2,500 units would barely make a dent in the problem today, let alone do much to solve housing over the next 20 years. And I think that's something we should all be really scared of. Um, I mean, this downtown community plan is very nice, but um, you know, uh, what good is it going to be if most people can't afford to live here and our children can't afford to live here? Um, I really think, you know, in 20 years, we're going to look back on this and regret that we committed to a low-scale downtown when we had the opportunity to incentivize more um, housing construction. Um, and I, th I also want to point out that in the DCP, um, the research found that there isn't a consensus um, on building height in downtown. So, you know, without that consensus, we don't need to commit to a low scale downtown and put that restriction and that burden on future generations. And I think a more reasonable thing to do would be instead to do um, a study so we can find out exactly how many housing units are needed to bring down housing costs in the city. And I think, you know, we should have those numbers um, before we commit to a, a low scale downtown. And, um, you know, it's, it's irresponsible to do that if we don't know exactly how many units we need to make Santa Monica more affordable. You know, and I know, I know there's like other numbers from, you know, the EIR and that kind of thing, but I, I think like we need more research about um, the number of units needed for uh, housing affordability specifically. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, excuse me, Leonora, there's a question from Amy Anderson. Thanks for your comments. Um, in talking about scale, I'm assuming that you're really kind of talking about height. And aside from the area, I'm still going through my DCP here. Aside from the area around the transit station, which is is up to 84 feet, we're looking at more or less 60 feet in most of the rest of downtown. Now, is it, are you basically saying you want higher than 60 feet in the other areas of downtown? Um, I think uh, I want um, fewer restrictions on development and fewer restrictions on height. I mean, I don't, I don't personally have a strong you know, feeling about how high I want buildings to be, but I, I feel that, um, you know, whatever is necessary to bring more housing units to downtown, um, that should be supported. And if like a height restriction makes that more difficult, then I don't support a height restriction or like down zoning. Great. Super clear. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Carl Hansen and then Denise Barton. Elizabeth Vandenberg and Mary Marlowe. Uh, good evening, commissioners. I'm Carl Hansen, Director of Government Affairs for the Santa Monica Chamber of Commerce and a resident of Wilmont, uh, living just uh, north of Wilshire Boulevard, um, a step away from the downtown. Um, the, the Chamber's uh, Land Use Committee is currently reviewing the downtown community plan and we'll be providing our specific comments um, in the coming weeks. Uh, tonight, just want to make some uh, general comments and, and, and raise a few concerns that we have with the draft plan. Uh, th throughout the evolution of the downtown specific plan and now the downtown community plan, uh, the Chamber and our members have been involved um, actively in public meetings, providing comments, uh, submitting letters with our uh, concerns and recommendations. Um, our position is largely followed. Uh, the, the, the vision, the loose set for the downtown is the economic engine of our city and, and what is now one of the last uh, opportunities we have for, for new housing after the uh, recent downzoning of our boulevards. Uh, we worry that the plan before you uh, this evening um, largely ignores those years of input and uh, we do not believe that it adequately contains a, a bold vision uh, we need for addressing our growing regional um, housing shortage. Um, we look forward to weighing in with our specific comments and recommendations at future meetings and, and thank you for your consideration um, of our comments. Um, I wanted to raise a few points for myself um, speaking as a resident. Um, first, I, I, I really believe that you know each generation should have the opportunity to see some great, exciting, beautiful architecture in their um, community and you know these so-called large sites which I think are probably more appropriately called medium sites um, because they're, they're not unprecedentedly large. Um, I, that's the, the chart that Peter showed earlier. Um, you know, we, we built the, the clock tower. We were brave enough to do that, uh, 173 feet in, in the 1930s. Um, what, what, what are we so afraid of now? Um, why can't our generation build beautiful things that the, the next generation will, will remember and look back and preserve for us? Um, second, um, you know, I, I worry that this plan capitulates to a very dangerous kind of fear, that the fear of change and, and the fear of the needs of the future. Um, you know, this is a, a fear that's building invisible walls uh, around our most desirable cities, uh, denying access to opportunity um, to many of those that, you know, didn't get in, uh, weren't lucky enough to get in first. Um, you, you can read about the, the scale uh, and, and seriousness of that issue and numerous reports from the nonpartisan uh, California Legislative Analyst Office um, and in Obama's 2016 economic report, um, which I'd like to read a brief quote from. So it says, supply constraints by themselves do not make cities low in affordability. Rather, the less responsive housing supply that results from regulation prevents these cities, which often happen to be desirable migration destinations for workers looking for higher paying jobs from accommodating a, rising, a, a rise in housing demand. Um, so, so, so what are these supply constraints? Um, they can be overly restrictive zoning or fees that encourage owners not to redevelop. I'm sorry, you can Thank write you. us a letter. Yeah, I will, believe me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank so, you. So I actually have a question. I have a yes. question. Yeah. Mario, you go first. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that this plan does not meet the regional housing needs, and we're going to supposedly create 2,500 units over the next 14 years. How many units would it take to meet our regional housing needs? 
Well, it, it, I didn't say that it doesn't meet our regional housing needs. I don't think that's it adequately easy. addresses our regional housing crisis. Well, what would be an adequate addressment of our regional housing needs? I, I actually thought the point that Leonora raised earlier, I, I think our city should be having a conversation with other cities in this region about the housing crisis and identifying how many units we need to be producing to address the housing shortage. But I'm asking you, in your professional opinion, having studied this extensively, I hope, what do you I, think? I'm saying I don't know. I'm saying... I believe it's your responsibility to do that research. Yes, he's right. Oh, wait, in the comments. So I guess my question is similar, but you step forward from the chamber point of view saying that you put a lot of input into it, which you don't feel has been listened to. What is the shape of the DCP you'd like to see, whether it's height or FAR or number of housing units? What is it that you think is wrong compared to what we see in front of us? Well, I, I, I think the chamber has largely supported the loose vision for the downtown, and I think it's incredibly irresponsible to be downzoning now. I think this plan addresses, you know, political problems, but not our, our real problems of the housing shortage and uh, the climate change, like Jason mentioned. So I hear that, but what I'm really asking you is to be specific. Do you think that we're a thousand housing units adrift of what the loose uh, is recommending, or is it 500, or is it 600? I mean, the chamber must have a position on this after all these years. I mean, we're in a famine, and you're asking me how much food we should produce. No, I'm asking you specifically. You said you made contributions to this process. What were the contributions, and how did it differ from what we see in front of us? We had largely supported the loose's vision for the downtown, downtown and not down zoning from the existing zoning. I just, I just don't understand why we're doing that. So I'll take it that you can't give me a more specific number at this stage. I, I think we're going to be very happy to provide a lot of specific comments as we um, continue to digest uh, the, the, the document. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Denise Barton, Elizabeth Vandenberg, Mary Marlowe. Good evening. Tonight I'd like to make points on the downtown specific plan, the downtown community plan or whatever downtown Santa Monica Inc. The extended department operating as a nonprofit organization is spun. From my January 2017 notes from the downtown Santa Monica Inc. board meeting. Starting with traffic, the thinking for the downtown specific plan needs to be more long term than short term and that they should be looking 10 years out. They claim not to be able not to have the flexibility due to complaints about traffic downtown. The downtown community plan increases the number of cars coming downtown when the need is to decrease the number of cars coming downtown. And the interesting analogy of going to Disneyland is better when less people are there like traffic was given. Now let's look at the present position of the promenade. The promenade is the third in Southern California to visit and that its identity needs to be shined up for more value. The downtown is a street if it loses its regional destination status or done was the way it was stated. The focus is on the consumer shopping experience and the, without the promenade, the city is just buildings and too many restaurants, making us just another mall and not a city. Next, let's touch on the pedestrian experience. Downtown may not be as urban as other cities, making it not a walkable city. The scrambles do not give a good pedestrian experience and that an opportunity was missed comparing Rodeo Drive, which is very clear and distinct, to not being like second in Arizona. Now let's look at the tactics downtown Santa Monica Inc. plans to use to get this approved, to advocate and influence other initiatives like LV, and to have to promote density and retail are good. To be more influential needs to be data-driven and to be armed with strong data to influence the city through boards and members' experience. That the influence of downtown Santa Monica Inc. in the city needs to be strengthened for both board and staff, and that researching what other cities do, giving data-driven information is the best practice. Other points of interest, that they think that they can have more events and law changes now that Marsh is gone. They need to create a more local feeling with banners, with children's handprints, or high school events, noting that events bring traffic, with the thought being that local streets equals reduction in city services and increase, increases taxes for residents and national tourists which equals profit and is the role of the promenade for the taxes it generates. Finally, I have to ask if taking away the rights of the referendum from the residents is legal because that's what part of this plan wants to do. 
Or what about the position of the police department, who claimed that they were not prepared for the influx of crime coming with the train? Thank you. Thank you very much. Elizabeth Vandenberg, Mary Marlowe. Good, good evening again, Elizabeth Vandenberg, Wilmont. Wilmont's making a strong showing tonight. Glad to see that neighborhood. Um, I want a sustainable downtown. I want a maximum of four stories to ensure we can achieve our solar mandate of solar on every building as we have actually put an ordinance in. Not every fifth building, not every tenth building. I want water independence by 2020, and I want carbon neutrality of 2050. This is what the city wants. I want it too. I want a healthy downtown. Let's figure out a way to get rid of those Starline diesel buses with their Knox exhaust coming down ocean and up Montana in my neighborhood. Maybe they could go clean energy. As I said, I want a maximum of four stories in the heart of downtown and three stories in the neighborhood transitions to Wilmont and mid-cities. I want 30% affordable housing, as outlined in Proposition R, uh, to occur in downtown, as we agreed to as a city in 2000. I want a supermajority for five-story buildings and residents voting on anything over six stories. I want the LV initiative vote count and God Be Downtown survey taken as real data. The latest cycle of blue skies and whiteboard discussions held by the city I'm just flummoxed by it. I'm flummoxed by the lack of using real data and statistically valid. I'm flummoxed why a visitor can have more value than my next door neighbor. As well, I wanna know what happened to the other three iterations of input before this one. We had a draft DCP, why didn't we discuss that? I want more ground level and green open space in downtown. I do not consider it open space unless it's at grade level. I want incentives for small and local businesses, retail, restaurants, and nightlife. I want delivery on the goals for circulation, mobility, and parking. I want to move from aspirations to definition and design. TDM is not going to make it for us. Let's move forward. Let's just admit it. And why do we keep saying TDM is going to make it? No new net trips. That's what we said our goal was. I want a real DSP EIR that provides some real options around housing. I want the gap included in our discussion. It has four opportunity sites. The Miramar, Vons, um, I'm sorry, the four opportunity sites in addition to the four opportunity sites in downtown. Um, and those need to be included as looking at the overall structure of what's gonna happen if we're talking about capping freeways and making that kind of investment. Um, I want the DCP to prevent commercial expansion from downtown into the Wilmont neighborhood, including not allowing residential lots to be, um, uh, what is that word, to be changed to commercial designations. Um, I appreciate all the efforts of everybody in this room on the DCP. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next we have Mary Marlowe and after her, uh, Rainey, Laborde, Laborde, uh, and Matthew Cariotti. Mary. Ah, good evening. Um, I'm here um, representing myself, but also the 18 people in the neighborhood um, council that worked on uh, looking at the draft EIR. Um, and we think it has some pretty bad flaws in it. So one of the things that I'm, I'm going to ask up front. There's no meeting on the EIR for the Planning Commission in the schedule I saw. So I'd like to suggest up front that there's a meeting at it uh, because this is going to be an important issue, I think. And I think the um, City Council is going to be looking to you as the people who look at the details. And as we know, the devil's always in the details. We are the people that had the 400 comments. So. Uh, I don't think you want to hear all those. So tonight I'm just going to give you a top line of sort of five things that we see that should be looked at more closely. Um, Mike Salazar has already brought up the deficiency in the um, alternatives. There's also some other problems that I think are pretty major with the CIR. There's a wish list of community benefits that would result from possible negotiations with developers. And it's really used in the EIR as a prime goal for choosing the preferred alternative. Uh, this is best illustrated by the rejection of the, no, of the reduced project alternative, which would be no tier three. In the uh, EIR evaluation, it says elimination of tier three 
would reduce uh, community benefits in large-scale housing and multimodal transportation investments within the downtown. Um, this is just a really big problem. Another one was that um, they looked at some recent laws that sort of limit things or um, take a different view in an EIR. Uh, two of those are that they, you don't have to look at solar shade and shadows anymore. Um, and I think for a sustainability, that's a problem. And the other one is you look now at vehicle miles traveled rather than uh, the service at an intersection. I happened to drive through downtown today because I dropped off a friend who lives there. Uh, it took me 15 minutes to go through three stoplights. That's an example of level of service. That's a long time. Vehicle miles traveled was probably half a mile at the most, probably closer to a quarter mile. So it, making that change makes a huge difference in the EIR. Uh, the other thing is ga gateway master plan sites, only um, the Wyndham Hotel was included as a project in the gateway master plan, but all the benefits, all the new roads, capping the freeway, all that was included. And uh, then lastly, <laughs> it was based on benefits and the actual physical improvements weren't there. These are all kind of wish lists. This is what we'd like to see. But the EIR, unfortunately, says it has to be what are you going to do about it? Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. I think Richard oh, has go a ahead. question. Sure. Did you get through all of those top five things you wanted to tell us? Uh, pretty much. Right, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Rainey and then Matthew. Hi, my name is Rain Laborde, and I'm a downtown resident. Um, I want to start by saying I'm really excited about the talk about capping the freeway, cost permitting, and uh, the further transit options in this DCP draft for the increased walkability and for the affordable housing increased percentages. As a downtown resident, um, I've gotten no mailer notifications about the upcoming DCP meetings, and um, I've spoken with my neighbors when I see them, they also have been uninformed about the upcoming meetings, so I do hope that that information can go out. Um, as to go back to the survey that was once again brought up this evening, um, I've stated in the past, this was an unscientific survey. It wasn't a random sample, it was a self-selecting sample. It was not a large enough sample size for a recommended margin of error and a recommended size to represent Santa Monica. Um, so I do still take issue with that being considered a valid survey. Um, and as was brought up at a prior planning commission meeting, that survey was not offered in Spanish at any time. Uh, Downsending Wilshire and part of Lincoln is not conducive to gaining much needed housing. At the very least, I hope that Planning Commission will look at allowing more, greater height on the corner lots, um, but really downsending at all should be considered out of the question at this point in our regional housing crisis. Um, and I also take issue with the comment that demand for housing on the west side is insatiable. It is not insatiable. There are plenty of people who don't want to live here, though I think they're crazy and I think we all do. Um, finally, the reason that I vote for city council representatives is that I trust them to appoint knowledgeable commissioners and work with them and listen to the public, but also consider best practices and civic needs. For this reason, I absolutely do not support a public vote on the three large project sites or even a council supermajority. Um, and also, if we're going to bring up LV tonight, let's remember that LV lost by a significant margin. Thank you. Um, I think there's a question. So I'm asked the same question I've asked a couple of your colleagues, which is, given that you feel that it's downzoning and downsizing and it's not an appropriate mix, what do you think is the appropriate level for us going forward? I don't feel that I have the professional knowledge to offer an exact number on that. Um, I agree with the prior statements that I would love to see more in-depth surveys in Santa Monica speaking with other cities to regionally work together and define appropriate numbers. Because if I hadn't told you it was down zoning, might you not think that 60 feet was a good size in that part of the city? No, I would not. Okay, thank you. I think that 60 feet is a good size, that is. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Matthew Cariardi. Hello, Matthew Cariotti. I'm here representing some high school students from Santa Monica High School. Um, I am not and do not pretend to be uh, an expert in these matters. However, I am part of the next generation. I have grown up, I have uh, gone to school here in Santa Monica, 
and if I want to live here, I cannot afford to live here. This is a great city with a lot of diversity, um, and if there is not adequate affordable housing uh, in this DCP, I fear that the diversity that makes Santa Monica so great um, may disappear. Um, I love the city, uh, and I really hope that um, the committee will be able to find the right balance of affordable housing uh, to ensure that we can maintain our diversity. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that concludes the public hearing. And uh, moving on to uh, our discussion, I believe Leslie Lambert has pressed her button. I press everybody's button. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no comment. Um, I just want to um, share what I know about the housing crisis question. Could I just make a suggestion before we do that? Could we take a break for 10 minutes? That's a good idea. It? Yes, I thought you, you'd agree with that. For me, right? Really? You'll second that. <laughs> 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 so it's a unity ticket.
Hi, everyone. We'll resume uh, the Planning Commission meeting in about a minute and a half, please. Okay, I'd like to call the Planning Commission meeting of April 26th back to order. Um, I believe we interrupted Commissioner Lambert for our break, so Commissioner Lambert. Yeah, but I'm thankful for it. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to address the regional housing allocation question that came up, um, and I'll be brief. Um, I, I mean, I think, I think we all know this region has a housing crisis, uh, unless we also believe the earth is flat. And and it's dire. I mean, LA region is like 100,000 housing units short of what it needs to be. Uh, and there's plenty of documentation about that. Um, in terms of the allocation that Santa Monica gets, it, as you probably know, it gets it from the Southern California Association of Government via the, the state via them. And, and our allocation is an eight-year allocation. It expires in 2021, which is when our housing element expires. The allocation for Santa Monica is 1,671 units. Um, although we came with a lower number because of capacity and funding scarcity and what have you, but it's 1,671. If you reach that number, it doesn't mean you stop. Uh, the last housing element cycle, and this is, this is telling, um, the allocation for Santa Monica last time was about a third of what it is now, um, and we exceeded that. Um, so if this expires in 2021, the 16, 1,700 units, there'll be a new allocation given in the next few years, and if, if the history repeats itself, we could be looking at 3,500 3, or 4,000 housing units allocated to Santa Monica. We may not be able to achieve all that, but given the housing crisis is not getting better, it's getting worse, and our allocation is getting increasingly higher, um, I think that we're probably looking for the 22, 2022 to 2030 housing element being about 3,000 or 3,500 units. Yes? Um, when you say we get an allocation that doubles every eight years, is every city doubling every year? I years? don't know every other city, Mario. Um, I, I just know ours. And, 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 know wh and why? What's the engine because that drives For one that? reason, it's the transit that we have. Because they give your allocation based on your transit resources, and now we have the expo line. Um, so you get more than you would, you would get if you didn't have the expo line. Because so we could check uh, Culver City, for instance, and see if their allocation doubled. Would that be a fair test? I can't speak for Culver City, but I can mm. speak for Santa Monica, and I know that our housing situation is not getting better, it's getting worse. So I, I can't, uh, and, and, and this is forecasting. I don't know the answer, you don't know the answer, Carl Hansen doesn't know the answer. But based on the housing situation in this region, I think that it's, it's legitimate to think that we probably are going to have a higher allocation next time. And that's the last eight years of the DCP, 2022 to 2030. And given what had happened to the zoning um, ordinance and the down zoning of the boulevards, we really are looking at downtown as the almost the only place we're going to be able to build dense housing, period. Commissioner McKinnon. Is this the right time? I have a couple of questions of some of the people who presented. 
I mean, what does that mean? <laughs> well, I have some questions to ask. Is this the right time? Oh, to oh, oh to staff. Yes. Yeah. I, so I, um, I think uh, the intention of tonight's meeting, aside from getting um, public input, was to really focus on um, how we're going to discuss the DCP over the next handful of weeks. So one of the things we want to do tonight is just make sure that everyone's comfortable with the topics that have been laid out, the meetings that have been laid out. Um, I do think also that if there are uh, burning questions or comments or um, you know clarifications um, that um, you're seeking from staff, especially if we're looking for any kind of additional data that we want staff to bring back in the next uh, the next few weeks. Those are all appropriate topics. Some of these are process issues and, and to do with the draft that we uh, received. So um, following on from Mr Cole's comments, um, in looking at this draft that's been presented to us this evening, the question that comes to mind is if there are parts of it we take issue with or have differences um, of view or differences of outcome, how does that impact the whole? Uh, it may be to Mr. Cole. Um, so we decide there shouldn't be three large sites um, with the zoning. How do you see that working? And then I, I guess the carry on question from that is you've produced this draft document. I am assuming this is the draft document going to the council. How does the Planning Commission's deliberations and reflections play into the council. So we may come up with a, let's say, 180 degrees alternate, and what would then happen? Hold on. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, let me take your second question first. Um, as has been the practice in the past, um, we take a, a period of time between the conclusion of the Planning Commission's recommendations and the presentation of the City Council. Now, you posed a rather stark hypothetical. And I don't expect that at all. Um, a dramatic shift. I, I wouldn't see our staff recommendations shifting dramatically, given how long we've been working on it. I don't think that we're going to see that dramatic a change, at least in our professional advice to the City Council. Nonetheless, um, Staff has traditionally, and I, I support that, traditionally deferred significantly to the opinion of the Planning Commission, right? Do you, we, we would, uh, if, if you make recommendations for changes, uh, we would take those and give them very serious weight uh, in potentially uh, changing our final recommendations to the City Council. Obviously, it depends on the substance, right? It's, it's not a, a popularity contest. It's not that we don't like the Planning Commission or do like the Planning Commission, but given the care and thought that the Commission has traditionally put into things, we've, te we've tended over the years, even before I was here, but especially since I've been here, um, to give uh, a significant amount of deference to the Planning Commission's recommendations. Um, and at the very least, uh, we would carry those recommendations to the City Council and, and point out where there's a difference between the staff recommendation and the Planning Commission's recommendations. I think your deliberations are very significant, which is why um, we've laid out six meetings over the course of, of this schedule. It's, we, we really believe that the Council as well will be looking to your recommendations, a question you didn't ask. Um, but I think uh, they too will take uh, and give a good deal of weight to your recommendations. So this is, this is in, in many ways um, the main show uh, here. Um, we expect that um, the council just doesn't have the luxury of, of taking six meetings um, to go into the kind of depth. Uh, and they appointed you to, to do the heavy lifting. Now in the first question, uh, you know, how does all this hang together? Right? Are there are there pieces that um, that are uh, absolutely crucial? I think the principles are crucial. Uh, the principle um, that this is a housing plan, uh, for all the reasons that have been discussed on on, on both sides of the perspectives here tonight, um, that that's a principle that that um, uh, we think is core to this. And if the planning commission didn't agree with that, 
um, then I think that that sort of un, that that's the linchpin. Another key is historic preservation. Um, there are landmarks in the downtown, but they're also character defining uh, buildings and scale and f what what you might call fabric, the, the built environment. There are a lot of nice buildings that probably ought not to be preserved exactly the way they look forever, in perpetuity, like 500 years from now, come back to a, a nice building built in the 1920s. That, that's not necessarily, this is not Florence. Um, but the, um, but the, uh, those buildings should not be torn down for new housing if there's a bill, if there's a parking lot next door or a 50s stucco box down the street, those are the places where these 2,500 new units of housing should go, and those um, character-defining buildings that people have um, both a sentimental view and which have craftsmanship and which have a sense of history and 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 are part of the the fabric of downtown. We see those over the course of this this 20 years having a very high level of protection. Um, it would take a, an extraordinary project um, to supersede some of those character-defining buildings. So that's another sort of principle. Um, a third principle, uh, which is probably um, uh, the, the most uh, contentious besides height, is the nature and qua quality and quantity and location of public space. Public space has been, um, we've, we've made a, a conscious choice in this plan, I think I speak for all the staff, at moving away from the, this idea of open space. Um, open space is a kind of an anti-urban term, right? Open space is what you want, you know, surrounding Thousand Oaks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, open space might be what you want in the, the Santa Monica hillsides, um, you know, the, the, the conservancy uh, in Malibu. Um, in a, in a in the downtown, you do want relief from urbanity. You do want gr greenery. You do want places for people to rest. You do want places that are quiet. You do want places where people can recreate, places where they can take their children safely, places where they can walk their dogs. So, so those, are, those are public spaces, and they come in a wide variety of shapes, sizes, uh, and purposes uh, from a classic park like we have at Reed Park or um, an iconic park like we have in Palisades or um, the Tongva Park. Um, those are, those are um, one end of the scale, all the way down to uh, simply an alcove uh, in, an, in, a, in a housing project that provides some semi-public space, some, some greenery, uh, a little bit of, of quiet and shade uh, in the, in the uh, urban uh, street wall. Everything in between. So we think, again, in terms of principle, uh, that, that is sort of key to this. Now, as to the three sites, here's what's non-negotiable for me, and I'm speaking now not on behalf of all the staff and certainly not the city council. I'm speaking on, on behalf of myself as the city manager. I've been very outspoken about this for the last two years. For me, it's non-negotiable that we do a plan and then we have a bunch of projects come in that don't conform to the plan. That, that is non-negotiable. That is not the way to do transparent planning. It, it is not the way to do coherent planning. And, and frankly, it's not the way to do planning with, with integrity and transparency. So what's non-negotiable to me is not whether we have three large um, identified sites uh, or that, that um, that the exact uh, parameters that we've laid out, which is consideration of tier three of up to 130 feet for those three sites, um, that's not core to it. But what is core is if you take that out and a year later someone comes in and says, oh, by the way, we'd like to put a very large building here. And the council says, oh, well, let's, let's, let's think about that. That might be a good idea. Um, that would, in my own personal view, um, that, that is a non-negotiable. We have to, I believe, move away uh, from the idea that the projects ought to be considered uh, as essentially spot zoning. I think that is what um, is, goes on in Los Angeles all the time and, and, and has consumed that, you know, the second biggest city in the country uh, with a very contentious challenge. And, and the only way 
that uh, Measure S was defeated was a solemn promise. We'll see whether it's carried out to begin to end that practice. Uh, I think it's a very pernicious practice. So what you do with those three uh, identified sites, that's up to you. Um, we've made our best professional recommendation that on the Fairmont site, it's already 134 feet, right? And uh, there's a couple of very historic features on that site. There's an, the original Fairmont wing, and there's this wonderful um, Morton Bay fig. If you are to, um, to address a kind of a hodgepodge of, of buildings over m many decades and, and redevelop that to um, the potential first-class hotel that the owners of Fairmont have the means to do, and if Santa Monica wants to have that kind of a facility, um, then we think uh, it should be higher rather than squash the historic features on the space. I think some good points were made about the FAR. I don't think the Fairmont will go to 3.0. Uh, I can't conceive of that. I don't see under the rules that we've laid out for that site, you could get to 3.0. So, you know, if you end up with less than 3.0 in the final plan, I don't, I don't think the FAR is, is crucial there. Um, the uh, the so-called Geary site, which is a kind of an odd way to look at, at land use planning, but the, the um, uh, the, the parking lot and the, and the fairly modest two-story building and a couple of, of um, uh, adjacent buildings that would be uh, preserved in, in at least the preliminary designs that have been advanced uh, by the owner of that property. Um, a, another great um, uh, sort of anchor to that very important corner of, of Arizona and Ocean uh, People have, you know, a wide range of views. It's hard for me to, to, to think that, that 45 feet should be the absolute forever uh, un, untouchable limit there, uh, given that we have a 300-foot building a block away, right? I mean, it's, yeah, uh, I think everyone agrees that ocean should not be a wall of Miami Beach-style high-rises. But we already have, you know, half a dozen buildings that exceed 84 feet uh, on Ocean Avenue. One more um, that had positive advantages to the community. I don't think would destroy the character of Ocean. I think, um, but again, that is um, a a decision by both the a planning decision in the plan as to whether you want to identify that as a site that goes above 45 feet. And then, of course, if that becomes part of the plan, then that project, if it ever comes forward, will have to undergo a higher level of scrutiny, which we've recommended as either being uh, a vote of the people or a supermajority. Fourth and, and, and fifth in Arizona, um, I, I don't think I can add anything to the um, discussions that have been had. And that's a project that's further along. Uh, both the Fairmont and the so-called Geary project um, uh, have been withdrawn, right? The, one, the, the, the mega projects, the 220-foot uh, buildings, those, those, those projects for all intents and purposes are dead. Um, any, any redesign, I think the owners will come in under whatever the rules are set by the council in this plan. Fourth and Fifth Arizona, we do have a new EIR. Um, that project has been downsized both in, in uh, square footage as well as in height. It's now down to 129 feet. It's about 62,000 square feet um, uh, less in, in line with uh, the parameters from the city council, which was to reduce the office space by about 100,000 square feet and, um, and, and no more than 40,000 of that to be taken up by other, uh, other uses, which is primarily um, hotel in the new, new proposal. We are not, the staff is not wedded to any of those projects. What we are wedded to is if you want to see potential consideration above the base that we've recommended in the, in the districts. And there are good arguments for those three sites that you ought to build them into the plan so that the surrounding um, fabric and the other rules complement what would otherwise be out of context spot zoning. 
And finally, on the issue of, um, of public space and forth in Arizona, I think you'll find the um, language in the plan uh, does not presuppose um, the project um, that has been proposed on the site, which the city is, is uh, we asked for that project, by the way. We issued an RFP. Um, this is a developer who, who, who just dropped out of the sky. Um, but the language in the plan doesn't assume that that project is going to be built or that it even is the right project for that site. That's, that, well, that is the purpose of building the armature for these three sites is an envelope into which consideration of the, the highest and best use for those three sites might fit. Uh, I went into some detail on that. but no, I think that's good because it started to answer a lot of the questions people have had um, about this draft and where those three sites fit. Um, the other half of, uh, I guess, the answer that you gave r really focuses on the capping of the freeway and the gateway access because by carving off the gateway access for some discussion down mm -hmm. uh, the path, we carve off three sizable development sites. And when you look at capping a freeway, you're looking at potentially $84 million of, of funding necessary to cap that. That's quite a large amount of um, return from development. So in thinking about the city as a whole, mm -hmm. with this plan, mm -hmm. it covers that site, those mm -hmm. sites, mm -hmm. as soon as it's implemented. But then we have a, another process that will go on um, this overlay, this gateway plan, but it is part and parcel of how we think about the city. So mm -hmm. um, that, that was the other element that I wanted you to mm -hmm. just address in terms of when we consider the plan, mm -hmm. the whole value of the downtown is what we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. How do you see that gateway plan playing in? I, I think the challenge with the gateway is whether, whether anything will really come of it. Right. I mean, um, at 84, if it's 84 million dollars, and um, it has to wait 10 years for us to figure out how to how to pull that off, uh, then it becomes essentially um, a uh, an exercise in there. There won't be any 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 change. There, the the only way um, we would consider. Uh, changes to the downtown community plan is if we had a way to solve some of the um, mobility issues, some of the connection between downtown and the Civic Center, some of the, the noise and aesthetic impacts of, uh, of, of the freeway running right through that, that gorge that divides um, the, uh, the Civic Center from, from the downtown. It's only if there is a practical way to untangle the spaghetti of every single weekend cars backing up uh, right. on the freeway at 4th and 5th in Arizona uh, and even then spilling over uh, into the Lincoln Avenue, uh, Lincoln Boulevard um, um, uh, off-ramp. It, it's only if we can solve some of those things that it even becomes relevant to talk about changes to the land use in those three sites. Those, those three sites will will operate under the rules set out in this plan unless and until we solve the problem of untangling the, the, the transportation um, spaghetti that's been created by the 50-year the scar of the 10 freeway going right through the center of our city and, and cutting off one edge. So it's really kind of irrelevant unless we can solve this problem of, of partially or, or fully carving, uh, capping over the freeway, that we'd even want to look at changes to those three sites other than they're in the transit district, they can go up to 84 feet. The, the rules are the rules. And it, um, so the, the, the GAMP is, a, is an effort to see whether we can transform that area. In a transformed area, we might want to consider different rules for those three sites. Okay. I have one, one last question, given that you're here. So this evening we've seen both sides of the discussion about housing. Uh, too much, 2,500 units over the next the lifetime of this plan and way too little. Where do you come down on it? Because, and, and why did you pick that number? Traditionally our thinking always is that you build housing and you densify around train stations and we have that train station down there and that's, that's the core of what the change around the city should be using that train station. So 
How is it you picked the number and do you feel you got to the right end? Well, I think it's fair to say on behalf of all of the staff that we didn't pick the number. Uh, the number is what we analyzed based upon previous um, uh, history of, of development, a parcel by parcel analysis of what is there now and the likelihood that a parking lot might change, a single story um, uh, shabby retail um, building might wow. change, a four story building built 20 years ago might change. We, we literally went through a very exhaustive uh, process that, that's shown on our website for anyone to go and second guess the assumptions. But we, we, we um, it's an analysis that says, based upon what's there and based upon the rules for um, development that have been set forth in uh, the plan, that, that's the number that falls out. Now, two things about that. Um, the, whether up zoning, down zoning, radical, you know, change that has been advanced by some voices or, or you know, a complete abdication of our responsibilities to the planet, you know, this, these kind of more hyperbolic um, extremes. The, the reality is, is that <clears throat> if you doubled the number of units in downtown Santa Monica over the, the period of time we're speaking, you probably would not affect the rent on a one-bedroom apartment by more than about a hundred bucks. Um, supply and demand is real, but 2,500 units does not make a dent in 100,000 units of regional. The west side is a very tight and attractive housing market. And unless Culver City, Beverly Hills, West Hollywood, Malibu and the city of Los Angeles um, doubled their expected um, development over this period, or maybe in some cases like Beverly Hills and, and Culver City tripled their development, uh, that, that would not affect. Yes, people do want to live inside the 8.3 square miles of, of Santa Monica, and yes, our rents will be higher than living in Venice. Just. The, the, or in Mar Vista, we have a better school system. We take better care of our of our parks and our streets. Um, uh, we have a way better planning commission, um, and uh, and so we will have some premium, right? But we cannot. We if we built five thousand units in this period, suddenly there wouldn't be a glut of housing in in Santa Monica. That's the challenge. Um, we, we, it's a, and it's, by the way, not just a Los Angeles challenge. Uh, it's a San Diego challenge. It's a San Francisco challenge. It's, it's not just a California challenge. It's a Portland. It's a Seattle. It, it's a Chicago. It's a New York. Right. So um, we didn't pick 2,500 because we thought that was a politically saleable number. We didn't pick 2,500 because we thought that would solve the housing crisis uh, in uh, on the west side of Los Angeles. We didn't pick that number because we thought it would be our fair share toward global warming reduction. That number is a, is a result of looking at what's best to plan for um, the next the evolution of Santa Monica, looking at what's there now and what the rules would allow the kind of, of housing where, the, where we really want to not be just concerned about the quantity but the quality. Um, of, of the 2,500 families that are going to um, be added to our downtown over the next uh, 14 or 20 years. So we didn't pick that number. That number is a result of trying to do good planning and good analysis and try to do a good projection of what good planning and good design would produce. Commissioner Perry. Yes, Mr. Cole. Another one your way. Uh, this may be... Uh, I, I'm at, not actually a planner. I just play one on television. <laughs> All right. Well, you do it well. Uh, going back to the question of the Planning Commission's recommendation, uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on the form. Uh, in the past, in a document like this, um, a sig significant document like this, 
Planning Commission's recommended changes would take the form of an errata sheet attached to the document. Would you suggest the same thing in this process? Um, I, I would look to Jane and to, and to David for the exact form. I, I think there's going to be sort of two levels, right? One level is um, uh, at the at the po uh, policy bullet point, right? You might instruct um, us to to move in a in a different direction on some policy matter. Not again, not a complete reversal of the of the heart and soul of the plan, but you know, you might say the um, the, the commercial parking standards um, are inadequate, right? So that's a that's more of a bullet point. You might not ever get to the exact what they ought to be, but you might recommend at a bullet level uh, some changes, and then we would have to, as staff, either during the pendency of your discussions or subsequent to your discussions, then translate those into changes. And then I'm certain that you will find some specific changes that by motion you will recommend that, you know, on page 17, paragraph 4, that language be stricken or that language have the following sentence added or that standard go from 2.0 to 2.2 or from 2.2 down to 2.0, that would be more in the form of the errata. But I think at a higher level, um, it's important for the, for the Planning Commission to make recommendations about any more broad policy changes. And I think we anticipate framing some of those questions to you as we did um, with draft two, where we basically said, here's four questions about housing Here's what we are recommending. Essentially, are, are we on the same page? And, and I think the, the posing of those questions will help the commission come to conclusions with majority votes about where you are on those, whether you're consistent with the spirit of the plan. And then, of course, we're um, quite open to you making specific recommendations about the um, language and standards in the plan. So from what you're, you're the, the process that you're describing, and it makes sense to me, uh, as we're going through and we night by night are taking off, taking on particular parts of the plan, uh, for those general statements, those general concepts that, that the Planning Commission might want to make, uh, to in order to have that see what that may translate into in terms of the change to the document, it would be important that the commissioners make clear during that process, during each night, the changes that we're looking to see so that we have an opportunity when it comes time to vote to see Precisely, how they translate into particular. Precisely. And that's the, I think Jing made reference earlier in the meeting to the possibility of essentially sense of the commission or straw votes, which is not you've by a 5-2 vote decided that the plan will be changed on page 17 to this, but that, um, that four or five of you, you know, have a clear, clear understanding that we need to take a, a harder look at maybe adjusting or responding to community input or responding to some of your um, concerns with the plan. So that will allow us to then bring back on May 31st some suggested language that would you'd be able to to incorporate into your specific recommendations to the City Council and that we could then carry forward either as our recommendations or as alternatives to our recommendations. And if we're, we're able to do our job as, um, as hoped for, uh, when would City Council begin its discussion? Uh, in July. Uh, we have two meetings scheduled with the Council in July. Um, they will probably be lengthy meetings, but we, um, you know, plans don't get better the more they're, you know, the longer the period that stretches out. Um, I think people get exhausted um, the longer they have to keep trooping to meetings and coming out night after night and missing Games of Thrones. Um, and uh, so, I, I, you know, we, we, we've heard a lot from the community. We're going to hear again before you, I think, the, and then we'll hear a third time uh, before the City Council. But I think the Council will look to the Planning Commission recommendations and the staff recommendations and the public input at the final hearings and be able to make a, uh, a final set of decisions probably in two or maybe three meetings. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. I'm not accustomed to standing up here and answering questions, so thank you for being kind to me tonight. <laughs> Um, are there other um, maybe content questions that came up for commissioners tonight that they want to clarify with staff or ask for additional information? Or I'm going to ask Commissioner Fonda Bernardi to go. Yeah, uh, we we don't have a place here in our schedule that's sort of blocked out for the review of the EIR. I think that should be added somewhere. Hopefully, and not a place to jam something else that's equally important, but it has to be there. Can Jing, do you want to give thoughts about how we were going to cover the EIR? Or? A absolutely. Um, we we should be getting um, actual hard copies uh, that we'll distribute to the commission uh, tomorrow. I know you have the electronic version um, at the moment. We anticipated that you know you you can of course discuss the EIR at any point. <laughs> Your deliberation, since it's it's meant to be a reference document and you know meant to inform, um, you know your your deliberations on the DCP. But we would recommend that um, that we have um, dedicated time for the for the EIR that is part of the discussion on May the 18th. Um, we were planning on having AMEC, who is the EIR consultant here on that day, because of the more technical nature of the infrastructure analysis that was done in the EIR, um, and of course on the 31st, um, you know when the commission is anticipated to vote. Um, you know, again, that could be a, a further discussion uh, on the EIR as well. So both the 18th and the 31st. Um, Commissioner Fresco. My question was actually related. Um, can you just explain to us exactly what our responsibility is in terms of the EIR and then what happens at Council? Right, so Council is actually the um, certifying uh, agency. The Commission is only uh, advisory in, in this regard. Um, so you'd be making a recommendation um, uh, on on the EIR. Um, you're not adopting, you know, you're you're, you're you're not adopting a resolution, what have you. It's a review and a recommendation um, of see. of the document. Thank you. And can I clarify? And if we had recommendations on um, areas in the EIR that we felt like needed to be strengthened or enhanced, um, how how would that be handled? Is that something that would um, that would get changed before it goes to council or yeah absolutely I mean it's a it's a final EIR at this point but there certainly could be um, you know changes or if, if there were factual inaccuracies you know that that, that sort of thing um, I think we've certainly uh, you know made our best effort um, to respond to all the comments that we've received and there there has been quite a volume um, of them and they've been you know very very good very thoughtful uh, comments and you know we have actually made um, amendments and changes to the original draft EIR to reflect uh, you know some of the changes that, that that have been requested but certainly if the uh, you know Commission um, you know felt that there were other other things that we needed to to explore um, you know that could be included as part of your your, your recommendation okay. Commissioner Perry oh. yeah Commissioner I was hoping Perry. we could just dip a toe into the EIR this evening and address the concerns we heard in public testimony about the level of analysis given to uh, uh, alternative two. Right. So the the EIR includes um, you know what we call a sort of project level, a very detailed level of analysis for scenario A and B. And what they were was they were basically project options of the DCP that you see before you. Um, the reason we went down that path is that council initially authorized scenario A. Um, just you know, and it was a um, re relatively um, high uh, amount of growth, and so you know that that was ratcheted down to uh, scenario B, which was um, sort of more of the the reasonable um, forecast that grew out of the build out analysis and also no net new new trips um, that the loose goal. Um, so those were analyzed uh, because they were essentially two versions of a project description, um, you know, so that mm -hmm. one could choose scenario A or B. So they're not they're not alternatives in that sense. You know, they were literally two. Two, two, two versions of the DCP, if you will. <coughs> As you heard me say, you know what what is before you now. The final draft is uh, substantially scenario B. There are certainly some differences because you know scenario B studied something higher, um, and it's kind of scenario B. And then in addition to that, there were then five alternatives that were studied, and they were studied to the sequel level of analysis. So it's uh, relative to the impacts of the uh, proposed project itself. So. You know, it's, it's not uh, typical for us to study alternatives um, to that very detailed level analysis, but it doesn't mean that they were not studied in, in all of the areas that the original project was studied in. 
um, you know, they, they certainly were, and there's a lot of information in there as to um, the, the potential impacts um, of each of the alternatives. Commissioner Kennedy. Um, Jing, I emailed you uh, or last week and asked if we could like add social ser discussions of social services to Wednesday, May 10th, and um, I think you said that uh, you would look into it. Maybe that's possible. Is that possible? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, you know, the, the uh, 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 concepts of, of social services and, you know, how they integrate um, into the DCP, it, it really flows through um, the document, you know, starting with the well-being lens, you know, that, that was introduced, um, you know, through the um, outreach process, and it's been a really helpful way, um, mm -hmm. you know, for us to, to evaluate, you know, the uh, performance um, of the DCP and, you know, how it's, you know, st starting to build a, a neighborhood and a real community downtown and understanding, you know, how, um, you know, you, you build a residential neighborhood and the needs and, you know, serving serving people that are, are, are future residents of downtown. Um, that being said, it seemed May 10th made sense. I, I don't know that it it's its own topic per se, but it certainly integrates into um, the housing strategy and, you know, as, as we think through um, services and, you know, we talk about arts and culture and sort of the, um, uh, you know, the, the sort of uh, software, like you know, that, be, yeah. that kind of binds downtown together. Okay. Thank Commissioner Lambert. Um, I was contacted the other day by the chair of the Social Services Commission who wanted it to be part of the housing discussion. Um, and he's available on May 17th, but maybe not on May 10th. So. Would it be okay if we did it as, as part of the housing discussion on May 17th? Because a lot of what he's talking about relates to housing development. I don't know. I'll allow the, I mean, it's, it's, it's up to it's, the, up, it, yeah. it's, such a, it's his availability that he was concerned about. Certainly. Um, I, I believe there was a letter submitted um, from uh -huh. the Social Security right. Services Commission to the, to the Planning Commission um, the, for the purposes of the deliberation. 17th is really more of a detailed level um, about project requirements right. and the sort of the implementation side of the housing um, question as opposed to the approach to strategy, um, you know, which seems to perhaps okay. fit into that. But I, you know, that, that's certainly the, the commission's choice. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. the other thought is to include it in development standards because there may be some issues regarding what's included in a housing project that relate to social services. But, so maybe it could be discussed twice. Commissioner Perry. Yeah, and I just wanted to point out that the chair of the Social Services Commissioner or any member of the public <clears throat> is able to come after we discuss a subject and provide in input and we can revise our recommendation accordingly. Mm -hmm. Or provide a letter. Commissioner McKinnon. So I'd like to talk a little bit about mobility, um, which in common language is, I guess, traffic and parking. So the, we have what, I guess what I think is fairly broad brush um, directions that we want to go in with some specific goals. We want 35% of people to uh, travel um, only, 35% of people in single occupancy vehicles. Is this the right place to introduce greater specificity into our plans both for parking and for mobility? Uh, along the lines that unless we do it now, we won't get it at some later stage, that right at the outset of the process for the DCP, we establish ways of reducing traffic or uh, reducing a, a greater reliance on parking or whatever else we want to do. Or is that something where, okay, top level policy goes forward and a series of later reports establish the specific methods of doing it? I guess I lean towards more specificity at all times. That's the real question I'm asking you is, why don't we strike harder for traffic reduction, for alternate, for forcing people to do things, to looking at how we um, deal with peak parking and peak travel, um, car travel right now, now's mm -hmm. the moment, mm -hmm. given that we've got a 20 year plan, if we don't do it in this plan, we'll never get back to it. Mm -hmm. uh I think it depends a lot on the topic um, specifically and whether or not we feel that at the moment we know the best information to be specific and the most effective way for the long term. So I, I think um, I sort of leave it to the commission to define some of the areas that um, you're grappling with. And then um, we could certainly provide you with some feedback about our perspectives about what is 
um, ready to be nailed down and what might be better to leave to some for future study. I mean, there there's a mix of both in the plan. Um, there's, you know, actual parking requirements, and then there's also a study um, to look at the administrative needs to really open up private parking more effectively. So both strategies are used depending on, you know, what we had, what, you know, what was available to get completed in what time frame. So um, I would look forward to whenever you're ready, um, some ideas about what the specific topics would be and then diving into them. Well, I think parking drives traffic. We, we've had that discussion endlessly here over many years. And this is an opportunity to think of a new way of thinking about parking in the downtown. We've had the park once and walk for many years, but how do we extend that on a wider scale so that we can downsize the parking and get people out of their cars on the margins? Mm -hmm. And those marginal areas help drive traffic reduction. So if ever there's a moment to strike for those parking maximums and to look at a change, this is that moment. And so I'm trying to encourage you to do that. And I, I know this is not always the most popular thing in the world, but I think it's the sensible thing to do given the trains arrived. This wasn't the moment five years ago. If we don't put it in now, we'll never do it. Yeah. And there is specificity in the plan. And, and when we get to that, going through that table, I think that's a great time to do it. I mean, the approach with the parking was to take um, the standards of our of our sort of mixed use transit um, in the zoning ordinance. So the, the um, right. more progressive version of what was in the zoning ordinance and then push that a little further. Um, so I look forward to kind of your thoughts on whether that was far enough or whether there's a desire to to go even further. And I was struck last night when I was watching the Lincoln Boulevard issue with our friend planner, Mr. James, that when we started on the bike plan issues six or seven years ago, we had some catching up to do, although we were in a leadership position and then we exceeded what others were doing. But now many others have changed and the whole paradigm in which we think about movement mm -hmm. it has not caught up with where people want to be. And um, with respect, I think that's the case in this, mm -hmm. that we have not sufficiently addressed the walking and biking needs of people in here with that specificity that I would have expected. And so, yes, I want that to be uppermost because we saw a slight fall in people who were biking in the last year. That That is unsustainable long run. Mm -hmm. So I think people haven't found it safe and easy to bike or to walk, and so they've looked elsewhere. And when you produced the bike plan five years ago, you had very concrete targets, things you were gonna do on the road. I don't see that in this. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel that we, at the, again at this moment, if we're traffic reduction, trying to get people out of cars, we have to do that. Now, okay. is that an appropriate thing for us to raise and to drive hard on? Um, it, um, I don't want to cer do it. certainly you're, you, it is appropriate for the commission to, to choose the level of, of recommendation of pushing any of the issues, right? Um, I think when it comes to streetscape, one of the, you know, there are a few specific recommendations in the plan. There's um, a piece of uh, sidewalk widening on Ocean, there's a piece on Wilshire, um, there is a, a reference to a transit lane potential on what the loose identifies as the transit corridor in downtown, uh, 4th Street. So there are a few things that are specific. Uh, when we do streetscape changes, we tend to do a lot of outreach. And one of the things that we didn't want to do was to catch anyone off guard with um, real like lane cross, you know, street cross sections and things on particular streets and instead kind of set the policy framework that would, that would support those types of specific project outreach efforts. But yeah, again, I mean, I look forward to what your thoughts are when you, when you read the detail and if you'd want more detail and if the body feels that that's the right, right specific thing to recommend or, or whether a specific study should be added because the plan still feels very car-centric, and I know it responds to the demands that are on the city, but it's a car-centric thing. And since we last met and had our bike plan discussion, there's been that fifth fatality and endless numbers of crashes and endless numbers of people walking who are in issues. And so it strikes me that we do have to be tougher and harder if we're moving into a new era of less people driving and changes. 
And again, this is the moment to try and get people out of cars and stop the traffic that's killing our city. Hence, traffic and parking assume a great deal of importance to me in this plan. And if we don't do it now, we'll come back in 10 years and we'll still be talking about it. Okay. Thank you. Other burning questions, comments for staff? Commissioner Kennedy, you're headed towards oh, your sorry. microphone. <laughs> I wanted to just, well, it isn't about the content, um, but more about the process. Please, yep. Um, that's even more uh, appropriate. We were just, you know, talking about um, ways our feedback would be received, but um, are we going to follow a similar pattern to the zoning ordinance update where um, because the different um, deliberation topics are announced, we're going to hear public testimony on those um, at each meeting on those particular topics? Are we going to follow that same kind of format? I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. Can you repeat it? Um, if I recall, and I could be wrong, um, my memory is not that great these days, but uh, I think we announced the deliberation topics in advance and then um, requested the public come and speak uh, at each meeting on those topics specifically. But we had a, you know, we, we had a little bit of leeway there when um, things overlapped or perhaps someone who really wanted to share something missed a meeting. Um, are we going to follow I can follow assure that you that I won't it? cut anyone off if they are off topic. Oh. <laughs> but we would encourage. <laughs> right, right, right. I think that I, for the benefit of all of us and the efficiency of this process, I think we would urge everyone to, you know, try and focus their comments to the topics that yes. we have laid out for each yes. one of the meetings. Okay, great, thank you. I think that's good to kind of um, announce it here this evening so that people know that because they can also prepare like we're preparing. Yep, I think we're gonna walk through this schedule before awesome. we spend tonight. Commissioner awesome, thanks. Yeah, along those lines, I wanted to, to just get clarification on the, uh, the uh, discussion materials. Uh, are those, is that information that's gonna be uh, distributed before each meeting? Yes, um, the the staff report that is that was given to you tonight, the written staff report and the oral one, substantially covers uh, actually a lot of what we're going to say. Um, as you heard me mention, you know there may be have some background materials that we've given to you before that we will reintroduce just to refresh everyone's memory, and it's helpful for the deliberation. Um, but we're not anticipating writing like a brand new staff report for each meeting. Um, this report will will stand. So, is it your expectation that we will be using this document to guide our discussion that we're we'll yes. be going yes point by point yes. although I will right so uh, I think staff will be highlighting correct for each the questions around each topic right for each meeting we will, most, we, we will have a more to focused point. like very similar to your study sessions in November and December we will have a a brief introductory presentation for the topics of that evening um, to highlight the guiding principles, the concepts, and then pose key questions to the commission um, that you may use to guide your discussion. Um, get the sense of the commission. Uh, we have uh, Carrie here, actually, who will be here every night uh, taking notes um, and uh, you know, kind, kind of keep keeping track of all the comments that we're hearing, um, you know, areas where we hear agreement, areas where you want more information, um, and that will be reflected back to you. Um, in your uh, final vote um, on the 31st as like here's all the things that you guys discussed here's where we thought we heard agreement so that you can see in text and then that would be your opportunity then to you know fine tune or, or what have you um, in terms of shaping a motion that evening and those key questions are those going to be distributed before each meeting we certainly can yeah we can certainly do that they, they, they're basically going to be in the form of a powerpoint presentation so we'd be happy to do that before each meeting all right thank you yeah. I guess uh, I wanted to take a second to just kind of build on uh, Commissioner Perry's question and, and Jing's comments to say that, um, you know, I look forward to lots of um, input from the community over the course of the next um, five nights at least. Um, and um, a robust um, discussion uh, by the Planning Commission. And I guess to that end, I would just urge commissioners 
um, to be uh, in touch with staff uh, around clarifying questions, around editorial input. Um, you know, it's really my hope that we can come into these meetings, we can receive public input, and to the extent possible, just dive right into deliberations around these questions that staff is, is posing. And I also f would say that, um, you know, uh, touching base with staff about clarifying questions, I think, is also an opportunity for each of us. If if we think that there's a question that the commission should be deliberating around, I think that's an opportunity to to communicate those questions to staff as well. So, um, Commissioner Kenny, I just want to throw my support behind the um, Commissioner Perry's comment regarding getting the questions in advance. I don't want to, I want, um, please times a thousand, let us have those questions in advance. I don't want to equivocate or sound like I'm open to suggestion on that. We, talk, we heard a lot of, about transparency this evening. It is really important for us to have, be able to consider those questions while we're reviewing the materials at home and then come prepared to discuss them with the public and that the public has the opportunity to see those too. Yeah. And, and thank you very much for doing that. We have done that in the past and, and um, it really helps us a lot. So thank you. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Commissioner Kennedy. Even I would say even less for us, but more for the community, you're right, so that they can be better prepared. I am prepared to uh, just kind of walk through the schedule as it has been proposed and then wrap things up. Is, is there? Great, okay. So our next meeting will be on Wednesday, May 10th. Oh wait, can I have the updated schedule? Um, Wednesday, May 10th, here in the council chambers, we will be covering arts and culture um, public space, uh, historic preservation, uh, and the housing strategy and social services. Uh, then we'll be, at, and that starts at six o'clock. All of the meetings around the DCP start at six. The next meeting oh, is the next night, Thursday, May 11th. We'll be in the East Wing of the Civic Auditorium. At least there's a change of venue. <laughs> Uh, and that night we will begin our discussions around the development standards. You know, exciting things like FAR, height, setback, step back. Okay, then we rejoin on Wednesday, May 17th, uh, back here in the uh, council chambers uh, to continue our discussion around development standards and in particular look at um, the review process um, and project requirements. Uh, Thursday, May 18th, uh, we're also here in Council Chambers where we'll be talking about mobility and infrastructure in the EIR. And then our goal is to continue the discussion around the EIR on May 31st um, and then make our recommendations with regard to the DCP. I have a question. Um, you indicated that on May 17th, Paul would be here with his uh, economic feasibility analysis. Oh, yeah. How does so the, there will be an ongoing discussion of housing, given that that's what he did, Correct. right? Mm -hmm. And and that somehow plugs into the development standards discussion. Well, development standards that's like night two overflow, if if necessary. It plugs into the because uh, it includes chapter four, so that's the review process, the large sites, um, so the the tier two requirements, project requirements, um, all of the uh, development standards that are in chapter four for tier like two. The inclusionary projects. stuff. Yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, so I think that's a good point. So the plan is that HRNA will be here on the 17th, and then the EIR consultant will be here on the 18th and the 31st. Any other consultants I should highlight? <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm dense. Um, I, I just want to confirm that there will be chances, because I'm not going to be here for two meetings, there will be chances for input on issues uh, in terms of, um, I mean, I don't want to come in and have 75% of the plan, although I understand my being God's my problem, um, kind of already ready to go and, do you know what I'm saying? Do you right. know what I'm saying? Do I know what I'm saying? Do we have to go to Florence? 
Yeah, I, I, you, could, you could you could pipe me in from Venice. Um. Uh, I recall, I, I kind of recall that there were times where a commissioner during the zoning ordinance update had an additional thought on something or had, you know, the week between the chance to think and, the, you know, to revisit things briefly. I mean, I imagine there'll be the chance, you know. I'll work on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm going to be honest, but to, to the extent that we can avoid returning to conversations and reopening them, um, I think that that would be an uh, appropriate objective. Commissioner Perry. Well, instead of reopening them, uh, I'm wondering if, you know, if, if there's a commissioner that feels like they have a number of points they'd like to raise regarding uh, an upcoming meeting that they're not going to attend, that I assume there's nothing restricting them from offering at an earlier meeting, even, even if we're not, what's that? I would probably suggest putting it in writing as well that we can distribute to the commission and the public. Yeah. <laughs> we'll hear you from afar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think those are both great points. Right. You'll be gone for which meetings, Commissioner Lambert? 10th and 11th. 10th and 11th, okay. Okay. Um, um, okay, I believe the meeting... The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Look forward to seeing you on the 10th.